OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. All right, you're very welcome along. It's Monday morning and there's too much. There's just too much to talk about. Kathleen's here. Kathleen, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. Also, Shane. Shane, how are you? Good morning, how are things? Shane's very bleary-eyed. Didn't get to bed until like four o'clock this morning. <laughs> I, I just, I, there was too much sport to watch yesterday. I, um, in the middle of it, I had a, a 60th birthday party for my Uncle Patrick. So happy birthday to him. Um, he's a middle-aged man and liker like yourself, Jer. I love the cycling. But um, in between all that, before, during and after, it was a day of... Total sport commitment. So I had the, there was of course the hurling final, the club final, the football club final. That went into Manchester United Arsenal. That went into the golf, tail end of the golf. Which bit, went into bit of tennis. Bit of tennis. We had the, Monster. <laughs> the NFL last night, Monster. I watched the snooker as Mark Allen won. I mean, Jesus, I don't even know where to start. Uh, what day is it? It's Monday, isn't it? Monday. Yeah, Monday. Um, uh, ridiculous. Meanwhile, Arsenal are the greatest football team of all time, Kathleen. Yeah, it's pretty brilliant, I have to say. Uh, I think Shane and I were talking before the show and saying, you know, either of us probably would have taken a draw, but then when that goal went in at the very end, I was like, no, don't want this anymore. <laughs> I want a solid win. Uh, I just, it was such a good performance. It was the first time in a long time that I've watched Arsenal United play and been like, oh, this feels like there's grit. This feels like both teams are in it. This feels like both teams are really fighting for something that they haven't been for a long time. And I think it was a challenge that Arsenal needed as well um, because there has been a lot of question marks over whether they can actually secure a title. And I think that match showed that they can. It showed you know, that they have the ability to actually come back after going down, it shows that they have the ability to stick in it until the 90th minute and get the important goals. So, yeah, Premier League champions. Gabriel Jesus down on the pitch celebrating afterwards. Mm. You know, not like, not alone in his castle counting his money, uh, properly involved and invested. And it just looks like they're very together. Yeah, and even if you look at, say, a player like Zinchenko, like when that goal went in in the 90th minute, he was literally on his knees, like screaming to the heavens with delight. (laughs) And that's a player that hasn't been at the club all that long, you know, has clearly bought into everything Arteta is doing. And yeah, it's it's a great time to be an Arsenal supporter, I won't lie. Yeah, he he seems to be the man. He's the one that's uh, driving things forward, saying that we can do this and um, we're going to be capable of... uh, of achieving great things. We'll talk about this. If you're an Arsenal fan, we'd love to hear from you. If you're a Man United fan, we'd love to hear from you. If you're a Glenn fan this morning, or, you know, a fan of honesty, truth and decency, we'd love to hear from you. 87 9180 is the WhatsApp number. You can also leave a comment in the YouTube stream, youtube.com forward slash off the ball. Make sure you hit subscribe on YouTube. That really helps us. And uh, apart from that, you can leave a comment on Twitter. There's a gazillion different ways you can contact us these days across multiple platforms. So please do get involved. Uh, but at 7.33 this morning here on OTBIM, it is time for the Gillette Labs performance rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lacked that intensity. You're going to be like Michael Jordan this morning, I hope, right? And I took that personal. Because uh, about a year ago, it seems, you were like, oh, Glenn, All-Ireland champions, nail it, oh, it's guaranteed. Mm-hmm. This is, I don't even think they were uh, club champions, county champions at that stage. Nope. Maybe they were, I don't know. It was way ahead of the times, Chair. Uh, I even had the clip ready to go yesterday. I was like, I'll better take out that clip for when Glenn win this evening. Um, <laughs> there, no. this, I, I, anyway, go on. Yeah. We start. Okay. Where do we go? <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, who knows where we're going to start? Can I give a couple of honourable mentions first before we get into the red? Uh, Derry beating Tyrone by 12 points in the McKenna Cup final. I watched that on Saturday evening. Uh, and Derry look imperious. Very, very impressive, it has to be said. Um, and then the Walsh Cup as well. The crowd that turned up for Wexford beating Kilkenny by four points. At uh, Chadwick's Wexford Park, was it 12,500 tickets sold by Wexford? Yeah. Incredible scenes for a Walsh Cup game. The, the Wexford County Board Chairman is one of the most impressive characters in the GAA at the moment. Uh, also called Michael Martin, and he is a future president, no doubt. But um, maybe, maybe he could be an administrator instead of president, so yep. he can actually be effective. 100%. And the atmosphere looked electric. I mean, a game under lights does the world of good when it comes to pre-season. And I yeah. think everyone has an appetite for, for going to, to live matches at the moment as well. So. Conor McKeown has great details in the, in the piece about how the queue was absolutely massive. But they've managed to finance the lights in, on time and under budget. And, you know, I mean, mm. <laughs> it's a very rare thing in Irish civil life where somebody manages to do this. And uh, bear in mind, you know... Um, 
the they 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 haven't got the massive population advantages that many other counties have, but they've been organised properly in Wexford now for the last decade or so, and you're beginning to see the fruits of it. And the game was a a classic fireworks. They hyped it up. They sold tickets before Christmas. It was like, oh yeah, that all makes sense. That there's a template there. So fair play to them and um, credit where it's due. But they're, they don't even make the power rankings this week. No, they don't. And you know what doesn't? Else, uh, the other thing that doesn't make the power rankings that I wanted to speak about this morning. Performance rankings, sorry. The performance yeah, rankings. Performance. This is, now that the power rankings are sorry, back, which rankings, we will talk about, don't worry. We we're going to get to that. Uh, we will. I wanted to give a special mention. Performance to, is a very important word here. Yeah, of course it is. Um, our lads and geriatric love and you know, finding finding love again in, in your 80s and 90s as an octogenarian or nanogenarian, I think is the word for someone in their 90s. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, first of all, on Friday, on his uh, 93rd birthday, the second man to walk on the moon. Um, married, a 63-year-old woman. It was, his, it was his fourth marriage, but best wishes to Buzz. And he says they're like um, a couple of school kids. And then uh, on the same day, we see Mick O'Dwyer, the Kerry legend, at 86, getting married himself as well, uh, Downey Killarney. So uh, special congratulations to himself and his uh, wife, Geraldine McGurr, who is 65, uh, a Tyrone woman as well. I think this will do great, great things. This could be a turning point in Tyrone Kerry relations, um, where finally they can get on and this forget them all crossing that. the divide. Potentially, potentially. But um, some of the quotes from Mikko, uh, there's plenty of photographs of Mikko Dwyer and his new wife um, in the papers across the weekend. He says, so far, so good. I've never cared about age. I played football into an old age and I always enjoy playing it. Age doesn't matter in life. It's all about how you feel inside. If you're happy to be with any individual at any age, then I think it's a great opportunity. It's great to be married again, and I have no doubt it will continue for a number of years to come. He said the pair met, quote, several years ago on the social scene. Um, described as a lovely woman. Um, so, yeah, you, you never know what's going to happen. He says, uh, what is not to fall for with Miko? This is what Geraldine had to say. We get on brilliantly. We bounce off one another quite well. I have no interest in sport, but we are great together. So, a bit of geriatric loving going on at the weekend. Um, caught my eye. Yeah. Uh, a, f- a friend of the show who um, may or may not want me to uh, read it, he's like, oh, I didn't have Tyrone down as number one in Mikko's power rankings. Um, can we all now agree that even everybody in Kerry thinks Tyrone were the team of the dec- decades in the noughties? <laughs> yeah. Are we getting... Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of respect for Tyrone down in Kerry. I heard the stories of um, you know Tyrone players getting clapped off the bus in, in Kerry for, for different league games over the years. Um, and there was the famous, was it the year Toronto won the All-Ireland, they got absolutely trounced and hockeyed by Kerry in the league. Oh, they did them a favour. 100%. That was it. That was it. They scored seven goals passing, that was right. Apparently, they had, Kerry had a night out, or Tyrone had a night out in Killarney that night. And, See, uh, and then they were like, you know... Bonded. Yeah. They were like, this after, is the end oh, of After it. the game, sorry, yeah. Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. After the game. <laughs> there was something about the pre-match, they were, like, they were accused of, what were they accused of? Uh, something down in the National Park, they were, oh, a full training session, but they'd gone for like ah, a... Ah, yes. To stretch the legs, and anyway, look. Yeah. yeah. You're right. The 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 wonder of love. I mean, Shane, you know, you you know, in your in your seventies or eighties or nineties, you might want some comfort. You know in what? Life. I, I was just thinking, you know, because and, and who are we to to you know no get in the here. way? Of, Fair play to them. I think it's love. great that you're still getting out and enjoying yourself and being like, I'm still going to experience life in all the ways that I can. Like. Yeah. And would Buzz Aldrin be rich now, Shane? Would he? Uh, he'd be he'd be fairly well off. I think he makes an, uh, about six hundred thousand dollars a year. What? And I only know this because um, his third wife, who he divorced in twenty twelve, the all these figures were released. Uh, right. Because he, uh, I think he either has to give thirty or fifty percent of the annual income to her and a, a number of other uh, bits and bobs here and there. So that the divorce was a little bit messy. All right. But uh, he's found love again. Some, some boyo, in fairness. Some boyo, fair play. Some boyo. On 93, he still scuba dives and keeps in, keeps in good uh, look. Nick. I mean, he does look great. Like, I had not seen amazing. pictures of him in ages, and then when you mentioned it earlier, Shane, I looked him up, and I was like, you wouldn't think he's that old. This yeah. is actually what you would have predicted for Buzz Lightyear in the years <laughs> after he becomes a superhero, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> many wives, still scuba diving at 93, yeah. going strong, making the press, like, just, just living. Follows the narrative. But apparently Edwin, Edwin Aldrin is his actual name, but uh, his little sister used to call him Buzzer instead of Brother when he was a kid, and Buzzer was shortened to Buzz, and that's why he's known as Buzz Aldrin, and hence Buzz Lightyear became a thing. Um, my family were asking me last night at the meal at the, for my uncle, um, Shane, are you, what's the story you just said? You're, you're, you're 30 this year, you're, you haven't found anyone yet. Oh. But you know what? Uh, my response straight away, well, M- Mikko is 86. No rush. And Buzz is 93. I've got 63 years on Buzz Aldrin. You do? I've got loads of time. Relax. The difference is, Shane, that they did also have other women in their lives before Fair. then. Fair. <laughs> yeah, Cathy, thank you. Right? Okay. But uh, you know what? There's hope out there for all of us. Right. There's hope out there for, for Mick and Buzz. So, okay. the two lads. Ha- they didn't make the rankings, performance rankings, but I uh, had to give them an honourable mention. <laughs> Sorry. 
Uh, well, we get into it. We'll get into the red, I think, uh, just, to, just to kick that off. Uh, the uh, frozen pitch debacle in the WSL. This uh, was something that uh, caught the headlines. It's a very the weekend. functional performance rankings this week, by the way. No, no, yeah. no word puns. Nothing. Just uh, no. yeah. Yeah, 100%. Cold and the names of the teams. <laughs> Straight into it. Yeah, no mess. This is going to be a good solid 4.5 out of 10 show today, is it? Is that what we're like? That's what we're aiming for. I'll take that. It's a pass, 40%. Um, Chelsea and Liverpool. I think 3 out of 10 pass these days, okay, Shane. That's you're showing your age. Okay, we'll take it. Uh, so Chelsea and Liverpool abandoned after just six minutes due to a frozen pitch. Um, I know, Kathleen, you were uh, tweeting the footage from the first number of minutes. And it's, I mean, if you put some ridiculous music if you put the curb and your enthusiasm music over it, you'd be like, this is a this is a skit. Everyone's slipping around everywhere. Everyone's falling. Um, it's bound to hurt because the pitch is frozen. Uh, and even Emma Hayes saying afterwards, you could see from the opening minutes, it was like an ice rink down the sides. The game should never have started. Uh, Brighton Arsenal also postponed. So this match at Kings Meadow between Chelsea and Liverpool had passed the pitch inspection two hours before the kickoff at half past 12. Well, see, this is the thing. It actually didn't pass the pitch inspection. It didn't pass it. It didn't pass. So the referee initially said that it couldn't go ahead, but this was the match that was up for broadcast on the day. Right. So Pressure. all of a sudden it was like, oh, no, we'll actually go ahead with the match, uh, even though the both managers have been told that it wasn't going ahead and both managers didn't want it to go ahead and neither did any of the players. But they're still, like, once the decision was made, they still had to go out and play. And, like, you can see there's a photo of Erin Cuthbert's thigh and it's, like, bruised. She's, like, bleeding Mm. because she slipped on the ice. It's madness, absolute madness. Well, who makes these decisions? I mean, I know the TV pressure is on, but and it's probably up to the FA and the officials, but... um, I, I, I know a lot of people were tweeting kind of the need for under soil heating and proper facilities. I think Vivian Miedema was tweeting about the fact that you know either it's under soil heating or it's let us play on the same pitches as the men mm-hmm. uh, and just sort it out. If there's something as far as women's football has come in both Ireland and England, like to see this on a weekend with a game as big as this was quite surprising. So those are the fact as well that only two matches actually went ahead in the league over the weekend because all the other games were called off as well for pitches being frozen like Arsenal Brighton later that day was supposed to kick off at like quarter seven called off about an hour beforehand fans had already travelled Lot Woman Moy who plays for Arsenal actually left money behind a bar near the stadium for fans and was like you know she said go have a cranberry and a bag of crisps on me but I think there were there are a few pints from the pictures I saw of people tweeting from there but you know just stuff like that it's it's ridiculous after England hosted the Euros won the Euros brought so much great attention to the game that we have like the majority of games not happening at a weekend because there's bad weather as several players pointed out they play in a cold country it's not like they're in you know sunny Spain where this happens like once every couple of years it's not even that cold (laughs) (laughs) this isn't Norway you know Um, there should definitely be a a fallback position I don't know about moving into the massive stadiums yet is the atmosphere not crap in big stadiums when they're not full as a fallback position no problems but don't don't all of the big clubs also have like proper training pitches and facilities that are amazing? Mm. Yeah, well, I suppose a lot of those are mm, not as suited to fans is kind of the only thing. Like probably somewhere like Man City that playing at the Academy Stadium, that's probably a good in between because, you know, it's a big stadium, but it's still, you know, accessible to fans and it's not massive. It depends on the club. Like Arsenal have attracted crowds of like 40,000 to the Emirates the three times they've played there this year. And the other one that they didn't attract as many to was the Champions League. And that was midweek. And they tend to be not as big turnouts anyway. So, I mean, there's arguments there for it either way. I think as a fallback position, if a stadium isn't as being fallback, used, right. why not use it? Exactly, yeah. Um, Or else if you know that like there's bad weather coming up, you just, there needs to be more in place. It's like, there's no way they should have gone out on that pitch. It was literally an ice rink. And it's, I don't know, maybe the manager should have sub- said more, or the club should have said more at the time and just said, well, we're not putting our players in that sort mm. of danger. Especially when we look at the fact that like the majority of the top players in the game right now are out with like ligament injuries, yeah. knee injuries, all the sort of things that you're going to get from a slippy pitch. Well, the, the footage spoke a thousand words because Matt Beard, the Liverpool manager, I think it kept cutting to him and it's like he's just there shaking his head the entire duration of the five and yeah. a half, six minutes or whatever it was. And even um, Emma Hayes' co- comments, she was like, uh, it wasn't playable at 9.30am, so they said to give it until 2 o'clock. There was a section that was quite hard, so they put blowers on it. They tested everywhere else. It wasn't too bad, but as soon as you take the covers off, as she says, it becomes a different situation. So the pitch was just completely not played. If, if it was Sunday League, it wouldn't have gone ahead because of all the slipping that was going on. 
All right. The other thing, the other pitch we should talk about is Croker has come in from massive criticism from particularly the hurling fraternity who yep. said, um, you know, this is unacceptable for the, the biggest club game of the year. We'll get to the situation at Croke Park in a moment. But, uh, OK, who else in the red? Yeah, uh, we're going to put Frank Lampard and Everton in the red. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately for Frank Lampard, he's been in the red quite a bit of late, uh, and rightly so. Now, he, he fronted up in his post-match interview, as uh, managers tend to do in this scenario. Uh, says he absolutely does not fear being sacked after his side were beaten 2-0 by West Ham in the league on uh, the weekend. Jared Bowen with the two goals for West Ham in that one. So Everton without a win in the top flight since October and uh, stuck in a relegation battle in 19th, 19th position. Not a good morning to be waking up for an Irish Toffee fan this morning. Uh, six defeats and two draws on this current run of form. Lampard's longest, longest winless run as a manager uh, in league competition, which is really, really poor. Um, but it's so interesting that, he, that he's coming out to afterwards and saying, ah, I don't fear the sack. Maybe he's going to say that regardless. Farhad Mashiri kind of uh, doorstepped by the Sky Sports reporters after the game and he was saying, it's not my decision. I don't know whose decision it is. Um, but... He, he would have to feel like he's close to the sack. Like That was Mashiri's first time at a match, I think, in, in 14 months, uh, watching the team. Not a great sign, though, is it? It's, no. like, <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, hello. Yeah, which is strange. Oh, hello, Grim Reaper. <laughs> oh, look, wait, wait. Yeah. Oh, it's a white horse, is it? I think Lamp- <laughs> Lampard came out afterwards and was like, I'm used to you know managers and owners. Our owners not coming to see us play. That was the same at Chelsea. Uh, you know, owners didn't see me play for for quite some time for the eighteen months or so I was there. But I mean, this per run run of form, you'd, you'd imagine, will spell the end. They're out of the FA Cup, they're out of the League Cup. Um, it's not like they have a trophy to, to kind of fall back on and have some sort of hope. Arsenal up next. I mean, come on, like what what are you going to do if you're if you're the Everton board? And I know that the fans are the fans are quite supportive of, of Lampard considering the results. They know and they feel that it's this is the board's problem. It's not necessarily Frank Lampard's issue. There probably needs to be a, a, a massive uh, overhaul of, of players at Everton. It's just kind of come to the end of a of an era, of a cycle, as things tend to do, a bit like Liverpool, but maybe worse. Um, but one point from the last seven league games. I mean, three wins from 15. Or, I mean, it, it's, just, it's just not good. I, I think I, I'd be surprised. I'm hearing Duncan Ferguson's name this morning being heavily linked. Um, I feel like Rooney. he comes up every time though. He does, doesn't he? change. <laughs> Big dunk. Yeah. Has he not got a job? He he's been out of work since he left. Oh right, I thought he, he, I thought he had a. Yeah, he he didn't pick up uh, any work, but uh, maybe that speaks volumes. Uh, Wayne Rooney will no doubt be being in amongst it. Sean Dyche, you'd imagine as well. I think Pochettino will be holding out for the for the Spurs gig when it comes up at the end of the season. Pochettino. No doubt. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like. That, there's delusional, and then there's like, oh, but you know, I might take the Everton gig. Uh, you never know. Uh, Everton are going to find it very hard to find a credible manager. I mean, I, I guess you go in and you think, okay, well, if we go down and I get fired, I'm going to get paid mm. relatively well. Deitch would take this, would he? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, maybe. It, it's, it seems right up his alley. But then, but then the Everton fans, the delusional ones who are like, oh, no, we want Lampard, uh, and we, we couldn't have Benitez, and we mm. couldn't have any of those other managers who don't play football in the Everton way it's like, oh, no, I think they do play football in the Everton way <laughs> and uh, so I don't know maybe they don't want Daesh yeah who knows but I, I would imagine the next few days will we'll tell all we'll move on because there's so much to get through uh, we'll move on to the Amber and uh, this is Kilmacud Kilmacud's 17 men 16 men I don't know exactly what we're going with but uh, they're, in the, they're in the Amber because it was an excellent performance a big win they won the All-Ireland Senior Fo- Football Club Championship for the first time since 2009 Dara Mullen man of the match full forward was, was brilliant Um I mean, I'm sure Robbie Brennan, Robbie Brennan had his uh, PTSD from, from last year's last gasp win for, for Kilku in his mind as, as Glenn were pushing forward towards the end. Uh, Shane Cunningham, the captain, was brilliant. Um, Connor Glass had a chance to win it. It would did. have been one of the most dramatic finales of all time and it might have prevented the massive controversy we have because it's a proper... Yeah. So the, the tabloids are the ones who are um, reporting on this uh, sweet 16 for Croaks. And they're like, oh yeah, okay, he's 16 men. Now, we should bear in mind that, right, like uh, it was 16 or 17, depending on, on what angle the the counting is done from. Not so sweet 16 for Glenn, as Croak's win ends in controversy. And extra men sink Glenn, which is kind of, you know, baldly stating the fact. That's on uh, Jason Burns' piece in The Sun. Mm. Bear in mind, this is a team who uh, last year had snatched defeat from the jaws of victory, right? Yeah. And as you say, there's PTSD from the previous year. So how do you get over that? Well, you've loads and loads of extra men on the field at the last minute when the ball is coming in. You know, like it's not like this didn't have a material impact. Yeah, it's it's a perfect perfect way to win, isn't it? Just for people who aren't aware of this, 63 minutes on the clock, 
Uh, it's a double substitution by Kilma Cudd. So number 10, Fox, comes on. Number 20, Paul Mannion, comes off. Number 19, Casey on. And number 14, Darren Mullen, off. But do they go off? I mean, the footage would appear not. So Mannion hadn't left the field when uh, Danny Tallon kicks the 45. The referee's arm is still in the air and he appears to be under the Hogan stand side. Um, you know, very much in earshot and eye shot of the, the 45 kicker. And Mullen, Darren Mullen, who was one of the substitutions taken off, was on the goal line for this 45. The 45 is taken short. Ultimately, it ends in a, in a, a wide for, for Glenn. The resulting kick out, the referee blows the whistle, the game's over. It's only a short amount of time, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Maliki works going berserk on the sidelines. Glenn are apparently to seek clarification from the uh, Central Competitions Control Committee. I, I don't know what's going to happen from this. I'm just looking at some of the quotes here. You from can't the, let the results stand. You cannot credibly, at the end of your entire season, have too many players on the field of play and let the results stand. Now, ideally, Crokes would be kicked out, I think, because they're the ones who have screwed up. I agree with you. I agree. That's what should happen. Yeah. And there shouldn't be this, oh, we could find them. Now, the other thing is, like, it shouldn't be up to Glenn to seek clarification no. or ask for a replay. Straight away, you come out and you go, this is a significant screw-up. As embarrassing a screw-up as there has been in an All-Ireland final mm -hmm. that we can remember. Can we remember anything as bad as this? It's, tw it's 2010. It's, it's live me, isn't it? Like, is that mm -hmm. the, the last time I remember something as farcical as this? There's maybe not as much being said about it. It's the what? fact, like, everyone definitely knew at the time as well, in the sense that, like, you talk about, I saw Malachi O'Rourke down on the sidelines, I was at the game, he was going mad. The Kilmacud background staff as well, they were also, like, gesturing the guys to get off because they could see that the, si the ref on the side was getting annoyed at the fact that they weren't coming off. So it's like... Now they're talking today and they're like, oh, the lads were just time-wasting, you know. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't, then they're doing it with knowledge. This well, is the thing. It, looked, it certainly looked, they were gesturing at players to come off the pitch. Like, I saw that from the side. So how is this so not... I was in the Hogan stand. How is this not cheating? How is this not an egregious example of cheating, right? Like, what we do, we'll have extra men on the field to play. Oh, it's gamesmanship. It's not. It's no, not gamesmanship. It's worse it's like, than that. In the last moment of the game... You have more players than you're allowed to have on the field. It's a 15 aside game and they had more players than that on. Yeah, you, can't, you can't let the result stand. No. You cannot let it stand. Alternatively, you let it stand and there's a fine. And then next year, when there's like a free to win a game, you just send on the whole team. Subs and all. Just pitch invasion. Like, what are you going to do? Oh, the game's over now. Sorry. Result on the field is, uh, well, we don't know what to do. Yeah. Like, you, you, can't, you can't let the results stand. And it, it should not be up to Glenn, but if it is up to Glenn to make some noise, then they've got to get out and make that noise and not be seen as like bad losers because they're not being bad losers. There's a, there's a ball landing. I'm sure we saw it in the, in the semi-final. Yeah. Croaks were like, oh my God, what's going to happen here? A, a six-point lead becomes like having to catch the ball under their own goal line in the very last second of the game to prevent it from going to extra time. So it clearly mattered. It clearly has an impact, a material impact on the result of the game. So I think if, if Crokes have any sense here, they're like straight out going, OK, replay, lads. Because, you know... Get the, ahead of it. The worst outcome. A the, fine, a fine for Crokes. I mean, it's... Yes. It, would, it would be absolutely meaningless. The Super. thing with Glenn as well is that, like, I don't think anyone believes that this is how they would want to win the championship no, at not. all. And, like, I could see from, like, Malachi O'Rourke's side if he's just like, look, I just... That's not what I want. But it's like you're saying, this is about the integrity of the game. It's actually... It almost goes beyond them winning a club championship. It goes beyond winning a game. This is about the integrity of what happened on the pitch and the fact that... Kilmacud well, cheated Maliki's quote comments uh, are along those lines he said afterwards uh, he's not in favour of objecting he says I can't speak for the club or anything else but I don't think that's how the club operates he's, be, he's too nice in that regard Maliki on this situation the, well, uh, the I, chairman though is, is coming out stronger yeah, he says well, uh, look, he's made aware uh, yeah I mean I think that uh, I, I think that I, it, there's this all oh, you can't be seen to be given out in the GAA it's like well I mean this all oh, well, just play, play by the rules Yeah, have the rules be the rules and then have that be the situation that everybody knows is going to be followed. Well, here's what the rules say. So, the, the Colin Keyes is reporting on the rules this morning. So, under the rules of specification and control 6.44BI in part one of the official guide, the award of a game to the opposing team, a replay or a fine, is the suite of penalty options for a team that breaches the regulations regarding an excessive number of their players on the field at one time. So, this can come from a, quote, proven objection or a, quote, inquiry of the committee in charge.
which in this case is the CCCC. Uh, and Column goes on to say it's not as black and white as it once was with a, with a depending on circumstances clause now giving some latitude as to the, to the extent of the penalty. So the onus appears to be for some reason, as Column is reporting, on Glenn That's to ridiculous. get... Uh, like the CCCC can still weigh up what's going on here and determine if, the, if there was an advantage to uh, Darren Mullen being on the line. But of course it's an advantage because it's an extra, it's an extra man in the eye line of the Glenn players. It has a massive knock-on impact. I'm, I'm sorry, it has a massive knock-on impact in that last second. They, maybe they would have floated the ball in to the... Yeah. Uh, like, like instead of taking it short and doing what they did, which, by the way, was either incredibly creative or a complete accident, but uh, also flashes just wide. And, and then the keeper wouldn't have been safe to go, OK, that's going wide because I know where I am. Like, it has a massive knock-on impact. Uh, I'm not saying that they would have won. I'm no, not, of course No, no one is saying that, that's but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. No. It doesn't matter. It's like... It's like the, the famous Offaly game when the Offaly fans came out and sat down in the field to play. I don't think they were going to be clear that day, to be honest. No. But we don't know. We don't know is the thing. You can't tell. Now, there's a comment here I just wanted to get to about, um, where is it? Fergus Keogh says, It's not cheating if the Croaks management were calling the players off, but the ref let play go on with too many players on the pitch. It's crap officiating. That's right. It's always the official's fault. It's, always, it's never our job to know the rules and make sure that the players are off. It's always somebody else's fault. You can always find a little thing to wriggle off the hook in the GAA rule book and go, oh, 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 it's, it's not written. It's not written. It's like, but just take responsibility. It's your fault if you've got too many players in the field. You have to carry the consequences for that. And the consequences should be serious because it's an all earned final. Yeah. It's the end of the season. These guys have literally been training. This is like the longest competition of all time. We, we talk about often the GEA not learning from past mistakes, right? There's a comment in here from Sean on the YouTube. Navin O'Mahony's played an extra sub in Meath Championship semi-final against Dunboyne in 2005 and were kicked out. I've got an article open here from The Independent in 2005. So Dunboyne clubs and Peters have lodged an objection over Navin O'Mahony's alleged use of four substitutes during extra time of last Sunday's Meath Senior Football Championship semi-final. Only three were allowed. And, and the Dunboyne PRO comments... This rings home. He says, We would prefer if we didn't have to lodge an objection and instead that action will be taken by the county board because of the breaching of a rule. Why is this being, like, this is 17 years later and it's happening again and all of a sudden it's down to the club to lodge an objection? Yeah, the whole, uh, depending on circumstances, malarkey is like, no, cheat and you get, you get kicked out. That should be, like, the, the whole, um, oh, we can find you because, you know, maybe that's the thing to do if you're, like, 17 points up and you put one on. Well, you're supposed to know the rules. Yeah. We're, we're trusting you not to cheat in the competition. And in this instance, I don't, I don't think it's with malice aforethought, although... If they if they knew that there were too many players in the field to play and they still were like, yeah, that's okay. I don't know. Yeah. Look, here's the thing. We shouldn't be talking about this. No. No. Now, well, maybe Glenn were going to steal it with the last second winner. Who knows? Look, Glenn, Glenn probably feel, uh, you know, reluctant to even talk about it because they had their own goal chances to win the game normally fair and square anyway. And points chances. Yeah, of course. To yeah, tap over those points when you're through one on one and there's a man inside. 100%. And you miss the ball, like, just kicked... I mean, the, hand pass it. We'll, we'll make an exception for you. You can hand pass that one over. Farcical. And the pitch, the pitch you mentioned, Jer, uh, at Croke Park, and some of the quotes from the Ballyhale Shamrocks manager, Pat Hoban, like trying to raise the ball on tarmac. He said it was not fit for a training session. And he says, yeah, for an all Ireland final, if that was the pitch, you wouldn't train on it. That's farcical. And you could see from the TV screen, you were there. I was there. Uh, the pitch like, was awful. It was the first thing I commented on when I sat down in my seat. Like, there was just massive patches where there was no grass. And was it awful before the hurling started? Yeah, it was yeah. bad both times. But, like, I. This is the thing, like, I know it had been raining and stuff, and I was kind of like, oh, maybe that's affecting it, but I don't think that is it at all. Like, it was literally like that from the very start. That you could see the exact patches, like, players were trying to avoid certain parts of the pitch mm. because they were slipping so much. Like, even the penalty that Kilmico got, it was doubtful watching it at the time, and he did seem to kind of slip as he went down, and that made it look a lot worse than it actually was. And that was the same corner the players continually slipped on throughout the game. Um, so yeah, I don't know what they've done to it since the Garth Brooks concerts, but you'd want to hope that they get it fairly sorted, fairly fast. Well, it was, it was covered for two weeks for the Garth Brooks concert, and then it was relayed after that. So, yeah. I mean, Garth Brooks is to blame here, isn't he? No, I don't think so. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Well, well, there's it's been, been so a many running games. thing since then yeah. that the pitch hasn't been recovering as quickly. So, I mean, whether it was relayed wrong or there's some issue with that, I don't know. But I'm sure they'll get it fixed. There's uh, they've a track record of getting this thing fixed whenever there's a bit of heat on it. So, um, I, and I mean metaphorically as opposed to like putting the heaters on like they actually have. Anyway, let's move on. Yeah, because, move on to green. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you think is going to happen? I think nothing's going to happen. Something should happen. Yeah. It'd be ridiculous if nothing happens. I think it'd be come a on, fine. Glenn. Get your lawyers going. Come on. Yeah. 
Make, make something happen. I, I just I, I foresee nothing happening, which which worries me. But um, you'd imagine in the next day or two we'll hear from Glenn and and they make their decision either way. They shouldn't have to make that decision themselves. But anyway, such is the the reality of the GA at the moment. Uh, in the green, Kathleen will be loving this. Arsenal. Um, so I, I need two tickets for Arsenal Man City. Can anybody get me two tickets for Arsenal Man City? How do we do this? Shout out. Well, David Myler sorted me, so who who does he know? Oh, right. <laughs> Just casually are dropping you, that one again. Are you, are you allowed to say that, Shane? <laughs> oh, well, he, he said it on air. It was okay, on OTB okay. Football Saturday. Yeah, All yeah, right, yeah. okay, okay. He literally got in touch with Harry Maguire, the club captain, which, which helped. Yeah. Um, Harry Maguire not playing for Arsenal or Man no, City at the moment. No, neither. No doubt Myler's played for someone on, on involved with either club. Uh, so, yeah, someone someone get Jerry tickets. Um, tough, tough to get tickets for Arsenal at the minute because the way they're playing, they're, they're champions elect, aren't they? Uh, I think Gary Neville in commentary said it was a retro feel to the game yesterday. Yeah, that was a good line. It really was. I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. As a United fan, it kind of had the keen... You could feel the ghosts of Keane and Vieira and Youngberg and all these lads. And they're all, of course, alive and well. Um, <laughs> but you could feel their ghosts. It felt like it was at Highbury. Hello, Freddie. Like Hello, Thierry. Yeah, all the lads. Uh, it didn't feel like an Emirates game. It truly felt like this was Highbury. And this was 2000 and what? Five or 1998 for the previous generation. Uh, this was a proper Arsenal United game of old. And I think the game needed Marcus Rashford opening the scoring the way he did. Um, brought Arsenal, I mean, Arsenal were, were, were the better team throughout. But I think United needed the opening goal to make it a game. And uh, I didn't expect United to equalise after Saka giving them the 2 1 advantage early in the second half. But the Martinez header really, really gave us a, a proper finish. And uh, yeah, bombarding the United goal for the last 10 15 minutes. And, uh, United can point to the Casemiro absence, but as Roy Keane said afterwards, you're going to have players missing. I know, it turns out he's very, 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 very important. And that's, yeah. not, that's not a bad thing. Like, uh, you know, uh, it's going to help to uh, just foster that sense of adoration that mm. he has from the fans, which obviously has already happened. So uh, it's funny, you all, as Man United fans, seem relatively happy with life, even though you've been beaten 3 2. Ten Hag, not happy, but uh, you're back. You're like properly back. One more transfer window getting rid of the last bit of dead woods. Whatever happens with the goalkeeper, the decision uh, gets made. I did think Wambasaka gets caught for the goal and it's like still not, goal, yeah. still not at a level yet where you're like, oh, wow, this is incredible. But uh, getting something out of him, yeah, it's the journey will be long, but the turnaround has been really fast and the Arsenal journey is like a, a pretty interesting template to follow where they went and spent massively and it really helped. Well, I think United can focus now on top four and maybe winning the trophy. They've got the Carabao Cup semi-final first leg this week against Forest. They've got the FA Cup fourth round against Reading at the weekend. Like They can definitely go for a trophy and finish top four. That would be a good season for them, considering where they've been of late. But Arsenal at the minute. I mean, Eddie and Kedia, the unlikely hero. Um, 13... Saka's goal as well. I feel like that oh. just sums up where Arsenal are at at the moment, that like Which... uh, such a young player can take on a shot like that score. And he tried it again like a couple yeah. of minutes later. Now, that Off one didn't post. go in, but like it was close. Yeah, I mean, like I didn't expect Eddie and Kedi to step up when Jesus was out, but 13 goals in his last 13 starts, all of a sudden he's brilliant. And Zinchenko, we've already mentioned, his ability to link defence with attack. Uh, I'm shocked, and I said it last week on the show, I'm shocked that City let him go. But Arsenal clearly are, are making making moves, and Trossard, another sign as well, who came on and was lively towards the end. I think he'll do great things with Arsenal. Yeah, um, he was a bit of a bargain. 100%. Uh, the type of uh, good signing that... Um, 21 million pounds. ...good teams make. Uh, okay. Very quickly, last one. Yeah, last in the green. We haven't given this enough time, by the way. No, we should we have given this. No. We should have like done twenty-five minutes here on yeah. Evan Ferguson. Yeah, the Irish stars. Uh, so what are we saying? Evan Ferguson, Podrick Harrington, Rashida Adelecki, and Mark Allen. I mean, what more can you say? Evan Ferguson breaking records all around him. Um, like that goal was. It wasn't just the goal. It wasn't just the fact that he equalised for Brighton against Leicester so late on. It was the fact that he straight away is thinking, "Let's grab the ball out of the goals. Let's go get a winner." They didn't get that winner, but he's got the attitude, Evan Ferguson. That famous off the court. bench, yeah, off, off the bench. That's great though, as well. It's Fantastic. Like, uh, I'm responding to being having like Danny Welbeck taking my place. Yeah, you know, many other people have not responded well to being dropped in the past. Sorry, you go on. Yeah, three goals and two assists in his five Premier League appearances, two of which have been off the bench. So that's a goal involvement every forty minutes. The Premier League tweeted yesterday the best ratio among players who have played at least ninety minutes in the competition this season. He's unreal. Stick your shyness in your back pocket, the famous Meath lad said to Sean Boylan. Why can we not get bloody excited about these people? 
Why can't we get excited? We're going to get accused of uh, the hype train with Evan Ferguson. Yes, Calm down, get relax. on board. Choo choo. Start him against France. Throw him straight in there. I don't care if he's only if he hasn't played a competitive game. The for thing Ireland. is, this like this is the first week where I've actually seen like non-Irish people get really excited about him and 100%. be like, oh, this guy is actually really good. Like all the English journalists were talking about him over the weekend. Yeah, the star is going beyond just us being like, oh, this could be great for someone for us for the future. Everyone else is starting to get on board, and yeah. I think when that happens, you're like, well, we called it. Harry Kane's replacement at Spurs. Oh, Jesus, Jerry, you've called it. My, that's my prediction. <laughs> uh, but Roberto, whatever Roberto De Zerbi is doing with him at the moment, stick there. You're 18, Evan, you've got a bit of time, but we're going to get excited about you. Yeah, Rashid yeah. Adelecki as well. Let's right. get excited about Rashid Adelecki. First run of the season, mid-season training, and... <laughs> Smash his own record. Yeah. So smashes their own record. So this is an Albuquerque, New Mexico, winning time of 22.52 seconds at the Martin Luther King Invitational, the fastest indoor 200 metres in the world this year. Let's get excited about these young Irish It talents. is January, but that's okay. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter. She's only 20. Um, midway through her junior year at the University of Texas, she's 25th on the world all-time 200 metre list indoors. 25th on the world all-time. Um, she's incredible. Uh, she was in the outside lane, which apparently is preferred in indoor sprinting as well. Uh, powerful finish. And she took second place as well in the 60 metres, 7.2 seconds flat there. Um, and, and she's running really well. I, I, like, there's going to be a big 2023 for Rashid Adelecki, you'd imagine. Um, but the way she's going, she's fantastic. Yeah. Let's get excited about her. Cora Carrington burning it up, nearly getting himself back into contention. The old fogey, yeah. Um, just short in his bid to become the oldest winner in the DP World Tour history. Um, didn't quite get there, but I mean, a fourth place finish. Well, What, what more do you want? Yeah, well, I mean, contended, right. contended a major this year, not beyond the bounds of possibility, literally earning more from playing golf at the moment than he has at any stage yeah. in his career. And they were kind of joking about, oh, the start of his Ryder Cup campaign, that's it now. It's like, actually, you know what? I, I, is he? Could he? Could he, he could, could do he it. Is. 51 years of age, Patrick Harrington. Like, I, you know, you would, I would, I'm certainly not betting against him. Yeah, yeah, look, I'm not surprised that he can do the 51, given Buzz Aldrin and Mick Dwyer yeah, can do it. Did we get everybody in there? Uh, Mark Allen, we'll just finally mention, I was up late watching him uh, finish off at the um, the World Grand Prix. Dramatic final. He was he was 6-2 up after the first session in the afternoon, 7-2 up, then 8-4 up. It was the first to 10. Joe Trump gets back to 8-all. Eight, eight Allen goes 9-8, nine, 9-9, nine, nine. decider then, uh, Mark Allen lumps over the line in the World Grand Prix, 100 grand for his troubles as well, so nice. a great weekend for the Irish lads. All right. At six minutes past eight, that is today's version of the Gillette Labs Performance Rankings. OTBAN's Performance Rankings with Gillette. Alan Quinlan standing by, we're going to talk Munster next. First, Paul Mannion speaks to Ashton O'Reilly after yesterday's win. Yeah, after the heartache of last year against Goku, it was in the dying minutes that they got a goal and they got to climbed the, the Hogan step stands and this year it was used and it could have been it, it all different with Connor Glass's goal went in but as you said Connor Ferris he got a fingertip to it in the end I know yeah I was just saying to him there I was like as a forward you, you'd be daydreaming or dreaming about like sticking one in the top, top top corner or spinning one over from distance for the winner and for a goalkeeper that's the, that's the equivalent pulling off a fingertip save in the dying moments and Jeez, uh, we were just so happy for him. Like Baggio, our manager, this, this, today in the, in the dressing room was saying, he was like, "Connor, you're going to win us. The, you're going to win us the All Ireland uh, today," and that's how it turned out to be. So it's uh, yeah, it's funny how these things work. Yeah, Robbie was saying something about at half time that he was throwing around the silver medal of, of last year. <laughs> <laughs> what was that about? <laughs> He'd um, yeah, he pulled out the, uh, the bunch of silver medals. The, from last year that we that we uh, that we obviously never got, um, but uh, he said like yeah if you if you want an, uh, if you want a silver medal here it is you can take it now if you want if you want a proper one go out and you've 30 minutes to win it so um, That's yeah the <laughs> yeah 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 it's a funny way of, of motivating sometimes <laughs> brilliant and you'll enjoy the celebrations anyway. Yeah, for sure. Can't wait to get back now to the clubhouse uh, in, in Croaks. There, it's going to be. A huge welcome like there was last year and uh, we'll, we'll let it ring for a few days for sure. Brilliant, Paul. Thanks so much. Well done. Thanks, Thanks a lot. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB GAA. The curry stuff is um, to always look to do when you're growing up. Whereas with Fossa, like, it was probably days we were questioning maybe whether this would ever happen first. So now, you know, as I said, it's special and it'll be all undone. It's the only thing if you don't get over the line next week. So um, everything knows is writing on that one. Subscribe to the OTBGAA podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. OTB AM with Gillette. 
Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Right, nine minutes past eight this uh, Monday morning. Nearly, nearly lost a day there. Alan Quillen, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, Joe. How are you? Yeah, pretty busy weekend, uh, all told. Um, and in the end, Munster, we're on the verge of like having one of those all-time kind of Munster moments. And uh, ultimately, they're going to have to go to South Africa now in the round of 16. So it's been a tough end to what was actually a really good weekend for Munster. Yeah, I think that was uh, that was the worst part of, of yesterday. I think, obviously, you know, you lose the game. You're disappointed. We've spoken a lot about, um, you know, taking positives out of a couple of Munster defeats. I think they've, um, you know, they've lost three games out of, out of nine in this this block of, of nine games since the November internationals. Uh, two to Toulouse and one to Leinster. And... Um, they were pretty close in, in, in all three of those games. Um, given the start they had to the season and how disjointed they looked, they looked unfit. They m- were making lots of mistakes and errors. Um, I think they can you know, be very happy and, and uh, obviously disappointed in losing the game, but you know, getting a losing bonus point. Um, and the way things turned out, you know, it was it's in the lap of the gods, really. It's out of their control when that result happens. Um, and they probably got the worst possible scenario of going to having to travel to South Africa because, um, you know, it's going to be very, very difficult. South Africa will have all their internationals, um, long distance to travel home for a week and then back out there for another couple of weeks for a URC game. So it's, um, yeah, it's a tough, a tough challenge for them, but I think they can be very pleased with, with a lot of what they did yesterday and, and the fight and determination and, and the improvement they're making. Can we talk about the, the tackle on Joey Carberry? Um, so if people haven't seen this, uh, Carberry gets hit very hard. And um, uh, I don't, was it a legitimate tackle? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think if you watch the footage of it, when I saw it um, live, I immediately um, expected a review of that. Um, obviously, Joey Carberry gets back up. Um, you need a closer look to see was it was it kind of chest first and did he come up into the head? Um, Joey Carberry's kind of head, whip, um, you know, whiplash back a little bit. He he got straight up off the ground, so he obviously wasn't hurt, but um, it was pretty reckless and dangerous from from Richie Arnold. Is there are there uh, enough wrapping of arms to make it? Because it didn't... no, there's not a ch- it, it, it like if it's not a. If it's not a high tackle, there's no arms wrapped there at all, and it's it's shooting out of the line. And I, I just, honestly, Ger, I just don't know why players are continuing to to do this. Maybe he gets away with it, but you're really rolling the dice, taking a chance on shooting out of the line. Um, of course, you want to try and you know get at the opposition players when they have the ball and put in a big hit. But we're talking about behaviours in the game and. Uh, you're in a really risky situation there, and you know I. When you look at the video of this, um, it definitely needs to. You need to see it, see more replays. You know I've done loads of games in France. You have no control of the pitchers, and um, they won't play anything that's um, the that 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 goes against the home team ever. Um, it's frustrating sometimes when you're on commentary and you're looking, you want replays and you expect them to, to, to put in replays. It definitely should have been looked at. And the directors there won't do that. They won't play it. But they played Ben Healy's one, didn't they? Um, very innocuous. Um, his elbow hits the chest first. It comes up. It's a penalty at most. Um, it's a really, really harsh yellow card. I just don't know what the TMO... Okay, there's an argument um, to say that the TMO looked at the, the the Richie Arnold tackle and thought it was fine, but when you watch the replay of it, it's very very difficult to, to look at that and not be really concerned about the contact where it was, the, the 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 lack of no arms, and given everything that's going on in the game, um, it'd be really, I I think it's really poor. It's it's very very high tackle. It's it's right up at the top of the chest. I, I presume he doesn't hit the neck or the head area of Joey Carberry, but he's leading with his head, and um, it should have been uh, it should have been looked at by the referee. Yeah, Rowan Kitt, the TMO, should at least say it to the referee, "Have a look at this," and yeah. then they look at it, get some different angles, and say, "Oh, wow, it's okay." Because 
sometimes these tackles are actually, they look worse in real time and they're just about below the line of, of you know, of getting penalised. So if anybody's maybe missed that it, was the, the case. The, the footage is, is of, you can actually see it on uh, the Heineken Champions Cup Twitter feeds. Um, they were uh, highlighting the, the exciting rugby at the weekend and that tackle. Do, do you think it looked risky? I think um, when when you slow it down, it doesn't. But when you see it in real time, you're like, oh, he's kind of. It looks like he's off the air, hurtling through the air. Yeah. Well, it deserved a, it deserved a second look at at. at it least. deserved a look. I think publicly to have a look at it. But look, um, maybe it was okay. Joey Carberry, maybe he didn't get hit in the face, which would that, the indications would be that 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 that's, that was the case because he got back up. But um, I just think when you see Ben Healy's one and that getting replayed, yeah. Um, yeah, but no, look, look uh, that, that's definitely true. Uh, like, Carby plays well afterwards, after the, the tackle, and is involved in one of the best monster tries we've seen in a long time that actually gives him the lead at the around the 50th minute. And then, then they take him off after that, or fairly soon after that. So is that a, a preordained change with Healy, do you think? Or did was there a bit of wear and tear? Because he actually, when he's making the crossfield kick for the try that uh, Munster score, he also ships another heavy tackle. Was it just too much punishment, or was it a, a tactical thing? It's probably a mixture. I don't know because um, I think when the coaches talk about that, I'm sure they'll be asked this week. I think it was a bit of wear and tear. I think it's a bit of fit, the physicality of the whole game. He got some heavy tackles. Um, and I think, he, you know, Munster have kind of stuck to the principle of, of of kind of emptying their bench. And sometimes some of the changes are kind of going, well, God, I do, I'm not sure if I'd make that change yet. But... Um, they believe that uh, that that's working for them, and it's freshening things up. And the players coming off the bench are bringing that bit of energy. So, um, yeah, I think he um, at times he looked a little bit um, lethargic and kind of just a little bit standoffish. Other times he looked really good. I think it's a really tough time for Joey Carberry mentally. It, it's 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 hard, um, and. Toulouse's line speed was phenomenal yesterday. And it was always, I said this last week, it was always difficult. You know, when you get dropped off an Irish squad and you go back and play with your province, you think, yeah, I just get back playing, get a big performance, move forward. But, you know, you go to Toulouse on Sunday and and you're thinking it's a very, very difficult uh, situation. But, you know, I think he did well. Yeah. Um, I think the missed kicks were very, very surprising. Uh, and even the kick he got, so I'm not really sure what was going on there, and, and I'm sure people are the same. Those two missed kicks were really uncharacteristic. Well, maybe um, he's feeling the effects of that giant hit. You know, it's, maybe it, that's yeah, possible. Maybe. Um, so the just to talk briefly about the tens where we where we have it up here. Um, uh, the Ireland selectors were at the Leinster game on Saturday. Certainly, the head coach and Mike Cat were both there, and uh, Ross Byrne has a relatively straightforward game. Again, misses some kicks that you would expect him to make has one fairly egregious uh, inside his own 22 crossfield kick that um, Rassing managed to snaffle and you're like, well, it's, it's, it's almost as if like all of a sudden there's just a little bit of extra pressure on and he wasn't as flawless as he normally is. But then the rest of the team weren't as, as flawless as they normally are either. So, I don't know, is there anything in that? Anything that we should uh, read into? Um, not, just to- not, not really, I think. Um, I think obviously... Which what's happened with Ross Byrne now, his performances are going to be um, looked at with a fine-tooth comb and people are going to question certain things and we're all kind of much more conscious now that he's back in the Irish squad. People will try and make, um, look for weaknesses. and, and But look, I think he's a very astute player. He's very uh, rock solid in what he does. Um, I think it was more of a probably uh, team misfiring a little bit early, early in that game and that that first half there was some mistakes um, Leinster may be looking around for certain players who have played so well this year at the competition to to give them a bit of spark they're up against a side probably who are um, you know really fighting for their lives they're a very physical side Rassing and they made it difficult so um, a combination of that a few errors but if you're a halfback and, and you're going to handle the ball 50, 60, 70 times in a game there's going to be you know some mistakes. I think you want to try and eradicate them and 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 do uh, most things uh, well. Um, so he had a couple of little things that didn't go according to plan. He didn't he didn't execute perfectly. The crossfield kick is, you know, it's just an inaccuracy. I wouldn't read too much into it. But um, you know, Leinster 
turned it around. I think, you know, he's he's. Um, I wouldn't be wor- too concerned or worried about that. I think Ross Byrne mentally will be in a good place now going into to Irish camp this week. We've had a lot of negativity, Alan, in conversations in recent months around uh, Munster, and and yet does there appear to be a bit of light at the end of the the Graham Roundtree tunnel? Because even defensively yesterday they looked without the ball reasonably good. It speaks it speaks volumes for the work Dennis Leamy is doing, for example. Well, it speaks volumes, um, Shane, for for what what the players are doing themselves as well, and the coaches um, who've come in. I think it's a very difficult situation, and you know, Munster are still short a number of players to 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 start winning big games in Europe and be be contenders for the competition. But I think what we've seen in in particularly in this these block of fixtures, these six, these nine fixtures, I think you've seen far more positives than negatives. Uh, some of the decision making at times, yes, can it be better? Um, but they're now a good side to watch. I know you don't win trophies being a good side to watch and still losing games. And, and I, I've said that for, about Connacht for a number of years under Andy Friend. They're a great side to watch, but would Connacht fans prefer them to be uh, a bit bland in, 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 in viewing and be winning matches and and squeezing the life out of opposition, sometimes yes, maybe. Um, but I think Munster are doing a lot of stuff right here. They're 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 down and a lot of power. Um, you know, Dogbo is missing. Thomas Ahern, Finian Witcherly, R.G. Snyman, obviously. Um, you know, but adding him into the mix that he's missing, he we we know that for a long time. But their their reserves have been kind of stretched a little bit. They're a little bit short in the front row with more depth. Um, but I just think the way they're playing and, and to see Fekitoa come off the bench, I think that's good for him. That's good for Munster yesterday. Um, they're they're missing a bit of out-and-out gas and a bit of an X-factor player in, in that back line. When, um, when do you think Snyman's going to actually see the field? Or what's the... What's the... Well, well, I think the talk is February um, for those those URC games in February that there's a real good chance that he's going to be involved for them. So that would be a massive boost for him and um, to have him in, 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 in that run... Of, of I think their focus has to totally switch now, um, which is stating the obvious to URC because um, getting into the Champions Cup next year, uh, getting a crack in at the playoffs in the URC is really important. And I think then they can look back and say, well, you know, it's like qualifying for the Champions League in, 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 in soccer and the Premiership. I think that's a really important box to take and, and it's still going to be quite difficult. But these run of games, Benetton, Osprey, Scarlet, Glasgow. Um, yeah, okay. They're four games, must win games for them. We should talk about about Leinster, who um, have won every game they've played. Are you know when they play badly, they beat Racing, a powerhouse of European rugby, easily in the second half. And um, you know some some of their players, particularly Ringrose, like Osborne, also really good. But there's just a, a standard now that they've set, where we expect that they're going to take care of business, and there's kind of like a Oh, why is this game still even at halftime? Like they, they've really. I, I, I know. Um, uh, Keen Tracy's right today, saying that actually there is problems. You know, two games in a row, the uh, defensive line out mall, two penalty tries last week, and a, a try off it this week, and the scrum has has creaked. Uh, so it's not perfect, but it's damn good. Yeah, they're not superhuman. That everything is going to be perfect in their performances. I wouldn't have many concerns about Leinster. I think they're at a level. When you think that Ty Furlong is missing, Johnny Sexton, James Lowe, Jenkins, um, Robbie Henshaw. Imagine putting those five guys back in the mix. Um, it's phenomenal. Uh, their points difference is 150. I think La Rochelle is the next best at 66. So it shows how dominant they've been. You know, you can look at the Gloucester game, the team they sent over and all that. But I think that performance and wrestling set the tone for them. Um, the way they've been going in the URC um, and they're a team that there's, of course you're not going to have perfect performances every match I think the first half is actually good for Leinster that people are kind of bringing this stuff up now that they're not going to get caught cold um, the only way to ever have a chance of beating Leinster is to be physical and try and slow down their flow and stop them And because if they you know the speed of rock when that's good um they're so accurate in what they do. Their attack is sublime and their lines are running and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think they've been uh, by far the best team in the competition so far. The tries they've scored, the pace they play with, 
Um, and they didn't panic the other day. You mentioned Gary Ringrose, just phenomenal rugby player. I think he's grown so much in the last couple of years. Um, doesn't panic. Gr- brilliant defender. His attack, his skills, lines of running. Jimmy O'Brien was outstanding the other day. Hugo Keenan, all these players. That's good for Ireland, obviously, as well. But, you know, I think Leinster will look at that now between now and the, and the pool stages. And, um, and sometimes the obvious, you can't do anything about it. Whoever they meet between now and the end of the competition, how far, wherever far they go, I think it's theirs to lose, really. Um, teams will try and be physical with them. But, you know, it'll be interesting to see how Leinster cope with that this year. Well, Ringrose appears to be, uh, you know, I guess rising to the, the captain's armband even he had on the weekend, Alan. Like, he's, he's been brilliant. Man of the match performance as well. A bit of an injury scare, I think, when he went over for the last try. A uh, bit of a clatter from, from Wade, but... He just looks imperious at the minute, and he's someone that Andy Farrell loves. We know that. Yeah, I think he's just very composed and and calm, and um, his conditioning is phenomenal. You know, he just backs up so many moments in the game. Uh, he's never stops, always looking for opportunities. But I think the biggest, impress- the most impressive thing is defensively in the last couple of years. Such a good reader of the game, physically has been sh- stronger in contact, and uh, he's just a handful for anyone to try and stop and and. You know, he's grown into a real leadership role as well. People look around him and uh, his composure, it's, 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 it, you know, his, his leadership is, is his actions, really. And he comes up with big plays and attack and defence throughout any game he plays in. Yeah, I wonder, is he a potential Ireland captain? Mm-hmm. We just assumed that it was probably going to be James Ryan who gets yeah. the Ireland captaincy. And uh, maybe, maybe we were wrong. Maybe, maybe one of the few undroppable players at the moment that we have in Irish rugby is Ringo's. I do want to uh, give Ulster some flowers. Uh, we have been, uh, you know, pouring on them, rightly so, over the last five, six weeks. They've been in the midst of an absolute crisis. Is this them turned around? Is everything, has the good ship been righted? Um... Well, it's good for them, and they showed a lot of character and fight. And I, I think they finished the game strong, which was something that wasn't happening in the last few weeks. Um, it was tough because Sailor are a very physical side, and I think if there's any sort of vulnerability with Ulster, it's that they can be a bit brittle at times. It can be broken down and got at physically. Um, I did to dog it out really in that second half. They're behind. Um, I think their reaction, the energy, the crowd make a huge difference for them, and. It helps um, when, you know, they're held up over the line twice and from both kickoffs, they're back up the field again. So they showed a lot of spark there and determination and got the job done. And, um, you know, I think they can they can put some of those bad defeats behind them mentally. There's, there'll be a real sense of relief here that they're in the knockout stages. A daunting task going to Dublin, for sure. But, you know, for them... They're not, they're not winners either. You know what I mean? They're not winners of this competition. And I think really important psychologically for them to be to looking forward to the round 16 game. And um, so everything's not completely fixed here. I think they've got to keep working on that. But I think the biggest positive for them was they showed unity and they showed fight. Um, they still have personal personality problems in the sense that they need better quality in certain positions. But... Um, a lot of positives for them to get the job done and get into the knockout stage. It shows the system is flawed, really, and the format is flawed when you win one game and you're into the knockout stages. And that's not having a go at Ulster, but I think we've all spoke about the format and people not liking it compared to the other system um, previously. But um, they won't care, Dan McFarlane. And I'm glad for him. I think he's uh, they've worked their socks off and they've been in a tough place. And that happens in sports, so they can take a lot out of this. Quinny, what did you make of uh, the Connacht team selection? Um, now, uh, uh, financially speaking, if they had got a bonus point winning against Newcastle, they would have been home all the way until, until the final. You know, this could run into hundreds of thousands of euro, and this is a time, as has been covered in the papers, of, of player renegotiations and contracts where they need that, that sort of money. Uh, as it turns out, they played a, a slightly weakened team, I, I would argue, and ended up losing to Newcastle, which will have repercussions. Andy Friend kind of defending the, the selection after the game, but I don't know what you made of the... Of the pick, the 15. Yeah, hindsight's a great thing when things don't work out. I think he's trying to back the depth to the squad and develop that depth um, within the squad. Um, Keen Prendergast, as it turns out, has had a foot injury during the week, so he wasn't kind of rested, but there was a couple. Um, not really sure what's happening with the Bundiaki situation, um, you know, why he's not in squads and playing in the last couple of weeks, but 
Um, again, it's a decision that Andy Friend hoped um, wouldn't backfire on him. Um, Is there anything in the Bundy a- to Munster rumours that are suddenly appearing out of nowhere? I don't know. There's something not right, Jer, anyway, in the sense that, um, you know... He's, he's in the Ireland player. squad. Mm. Ireland obviously yeah, don't player, feel like there's player anything... player of that quality. Yeah. Yeah, a player of that quality in the last period of time for Ireland. He's been brilliant, so... Um, not sure what it is, so we're only speculating. But um, good, there's good, something a good signing from Munster, not right there. If it does It'd happen, be phenomenal signing from Munster. I think you know it's it's kind of fans are, won't be happy to hear that. But me saying that, but look, Munster needed probably needed twelve. I don't know if Fekato will be staying on. Um, they need a tight head as well, and and maybe other reinforcements in the front row. And they're going to go and try and strengthen anyway. Um, but for Connacht, I look. I think. The URC has to be um, their bread and butter, and this probably backfired a little bit with them. But they came up against a strong Newcastle side who were probably uh, wanted to get a home performance themselves. And these are the judgment calls they make. I, I wouldn't criticise Andy Friend and say, "Well, you should have, you should have made picked certain guys that you left out." But um, they've got to try and develop their strength as well there. But um, unfortunately, okay. they're away now in the round sixteen. All right, Quinny, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers, thanks, lads. More from Quinny on the Red 78 podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. It is 8.31 this morning, and a reminder, we're brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Now, Braeburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of OTB. Braeburn Coffee is coming to an Apple Green store near you with new Braeburn locations popping up every month. So visit applegreenstores.com forward slash Braeburn to find your nearest Braeburn Coffee experience. It's time for the papers. <laughs> <laughs> so serious, but I love it. <laughs> News of ten uh, with Jer Gilroy. Uh, right, mm, catch us if you can. And Kedia winner sees off United Arsenal three man United two. Sweet sixteen for Croaks. Will it, will it always be tarnished? Will they ever really be able to enjoy themselves? These Croaks? asterisk, massive asterisk. Yeah. Was it not seventeen? Uh, that wouldn't the headlines wouldn't be as good with seventeen. But no, sixteen but we're going it, with. It might have been seventeen. Yeah. Well, Man United was over there towards that touchline, but uh, certainly. Darren Mullen was on the goal line so it was definitely a bittersweet 16 uh, this isn't going to go away it's not going to go away uh, uh, it could easily go away it, like it, it could uh, it, Glenn could just say look mm, on the pitch on the pitch if they and that and that would be the end of it and it shouldn't be it, it shouldn't. shouldn't be up to them we know that well, I don't Jeez. know what, what, uh, what do you think out there uh, you can leave a comment in the YouTube stream Unstoppable Gunners is the front of the Daily Telegraph this morning. Leaders have 50 points with just half the season gone. Can anybody halt Arsenal's title march? It will be an all-time choke job if they lose. Me. Oh, yeah, yeah. It will be an Arsenal job. I mean, it might not be. Like, there might be the possibility that maybe uh, City reel off the 16 in a row that we've been talking about yeah, for the yeah. last while. But Erling Haaland is good at football again after he's, a couple of weeks where he was okay. bad at football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's like scored 100 goals in like a week. Did someone um, say yesterday he's got 25 Premier League goals already this season? Is that, uh, is was that it not all, in all competitions? Was it? My brother said in Premier League, so if, if my brother's listening and you're wrong, then yeah, well, uh, you're good, wrong. Good that you researched that before bringing it yeah, to the air. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> my research has listened to my brother talk at half 11 at night as the second NFL game is starting. Just as you start to snooze off. Exactly, yeah. yeah 100%. Uh, well, we could. He does 20, have 25, 25 Premier goals, goals yeah, in Premier League. There you go. go. Uh, numbers up Croaks had 17 men on the pitch in frantic finale says Philip Lannick. I mean it's a slight advantage to have two extra men running around running interference on the free kicks farcical absolutely farcical the, the YouTube comments are already coming in someone says the extra man had no influence Glenn wanted to get on with it but referee should have blown the whistle and held the game till the correct players were on the pitch simple um, other people aren't quite as uh, easy going um, I don't know tapping the wrist is that what they're going to get I don't know like, I don't know uh, Munster are heading into the Sharks' mouth, so down to Durban. The Sharks have Springbok stars such as Sia Khaleesi, Eben Etzebeth and Lucanio Am on their panel, and um, so that'll be a good game. 100%. I mean, I'm sure they would have preferred not to have that trip on their on the horizon, but so be it. Steady, Eddie, is the exciting headline in the back, <laughs> in the back of the Guardian this morning. Arteta Warren's Gunners are not at city level yet. Which, which city Arsenal game were you looking tickets for? the league game ok because so, someone has commented James McCullough hi Jerry I can sort you out two adults two children tickets for City v Arsenal this coming Friday if you want them Oh, that would have been great if it was that game that I was looking for sorry I should have specified yeah. it's, the, it's yeah. the league game okay. uh, Ed Devil and Keddy at the double to halt United title charge Arteta Joy as Gunners race to their fastest 50 points 
Um, Arteta's antics, which obviously, mm. uh, what's his name, had been on before everybody else, yeah. had, has now become a thing. Is Arteta Ten Hag going to become Fergie Wenger? It won't, won't quite have the same luster, but I think well, they, it could yeah. become because I, I feel like Ten Hag's going to be there for, for Ten Hag's, some time. Ten Hag's nasty enough, isn't he? Yeah, he can be. You I know? saw a great clip on TikTok at the weekend of a 13 year old Ten Hag talking to you on Cruyff on a Dutch chat show. All oh, right. And uh, Cruyff is just sitting there looking for advice off all these kids. And Ten Hag, very seriously, says, I don't think you should shout at, at young young players. They need to be matured and, and looked after. And it was, just, it was so, so beyond his years for the 13 year old Ten Hag. Must get the clip out. Extra men sink Glenn is the headline on the back of the sun. Uh, 17 on field for Croaks and win. Glenn want answers after Kilmacud appeared to finish yesterday's All Ireland Club final with two extra players on the pitch. And not because of red cards, which you know you might expect as a team from the north. Yeah. They traditionally come down and get a bunch of red cards as they lose their, their heads in the final. Oh, they're not from Tyrone, they're from Derry. Sorry, yeah. I, 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 was Derry. In, I was incorrect. I was yeah. stereotyping. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Incredibles. Two goal Eddie fires extraordinary gunners to win over United in old school thriller, says Mirror Sport, and not so sweet 16 for Glenn. As Croak's win ends in controversy and all hail. Bally Hale, in fairness, yeah. come back from uh, losing last year's final in heartbreaking circumstances to win. And it was the same. It's like a great narrative. And I think that's the story that they've gone for in the front of the um, Irish Times this morning. Yeah. Kill McCudden, Bally Hale find redemption in final victories. They're not going as heavy on the... Um, is that the city final? No, is it the final final? It might not be. It didn't look, Dunloy had a free to, to bring it back to three points with the last minute just before the end of injury time and I was thinking, okay, Dunloy can get a goal here. But then, of course, Bally Hill string off what, three or four points on, on the trot to win by seven. I think the bookies had the spread at seven so they got that fairly fairly right in the Bally Hill dunloy game. But fair play to Dunloy, what a run. Even beating St. Thomas in the semi-final. They can be pretty proud of themselves as they head back up to Antrim. Um, yeah, so there you go. Uh, no, I didn't mention the 17 there. Uh, and catch it if you can. Ha trick hero. Erling Haaland. Haaland. Ha oh, oh, trick hero. Haaland. Uh, Michael Collins, not not uh, either the astronaut or the uh, revolutionary leader, says on YouTube Is Jer dreaming of a 49ers Super Bowl win? Eagles 2.5 point favourites. They should be two great championship games. I think the Eagles were unbelievable yeah. against the Giants. Now, it turns out the Giants are pretty shit um, crap, yeah. I don't know if uh, people were, were watching that game the other night but um, and then also Joe Burrow oh just in the snow surgically destroying the Bills who were supposed to be the team of destiny yeah after what happened to DeMar Hamlin um, it turns out sport doesn't really care about all those uh, disrespect to the to the things. Bengals not being favourites of that game given they were in the Super Bowl last year isn't it uh, well the Bills have been absolutely yeah, sensational been all year yeah, yeah. and uh, they, the Bengals were grand the previous week not mm. great so First time in a long time I think the AFC Championship game is the same two years in a row Chiefs Bengals so that's going to be interesting The other thing is Patrick Mahomes has a high ankle sprain I don't know if everybody saw this but Sorry a, I don't know Like he is the greatest athlete in the world at the moment and it's not even close Can I, can I just make a point on that? I was watching that game the Chiefs game the other night and I was like it, it, was, it felt like American exception I was just waiting for a, a fighter jet to fly over as, as Mahomes limped about I was like this guy this guy it was like the I think my brother said it's like the, the Kobe Bryant flu game Michael Jordan or Michael game. Jordan flew game. He wanted his moment, where he was like, "Look so at you, me, look at me, you, you limping think, along here." You think he's like? Um, he was exaggerating the limp. Oh well, we'll see, we'll see, because he went off. He, they took him out of the game. They put him back in. He's been diagnosed with a high ankle sprain, so maybe you think he's faking it. He's uh, not necessarily faking. Oh. I think he's exaggerating Shots for effect. Fired. For effect, right? I mean, look at me. I'm I, I'm going to take the feckin' Chiefs all the way to the the championship game on a on a bad ankle. Look at me. Look how great I am. And, and he's on the sideline. Don't take me off. I'm staying on. Yeah. Just, there's something real American about the whole thing. I was just waiting for like someone to walk out with a big massive flag. And they do that before ball the game. Eagle, a bald eagle to fly over um, Holmes' head as he was uh, limping on. I don't know. It, was, it, it felt all a bit ridiculous to me. Sorry, Patrick, if you were truly, truly injured. The rest of the world thinks this is one of the greatest things they've ever seen. No, Shane's yeah. like, nah, nah, come on. Not buying it. Would he, would he survive a club game in Toronto? He wouldn't. No, not at all. Get up. Uh, it's 8.38 OTBIM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day Carl Milani is with us Carl, where are we going? Hi lads, how's it going? Well, good day Crow Park yesterday um, I don't think there's anything in the extra players on the What? Field. What? No. What are you talking about? No. Why not? What, what, what material impact did it well, have? What are you it talking might, it doesn't about? Matter, it doesn't matter Can you just cheat? No, so, but it didn't have any material what? impact It doesn't uh, How? Okay, first off how does it not have a material impact when for the last well, play of the game there are extra players preventing the ball from going goal bound. For a team, by the way, who are absolutely terrified about the impending play. Final play of the game. Their their dreams, their whole thing. All year they've been talking about being losers. 
and all of a sudden they have an extra man on the field helping them to win the game. What's your club in Sligo? Ennis Crown. If Ennis Crown, if that's Ennis Crown, if that's Ennis, if Ennis Crown are playing in this situ- situation, you're you're fuming. Well, Malachy O'Rourke poured cold water on any suggestions that they'd look for a replay. That's because he's a lovely man. He's uh, an absolute uh, gentleman. But it should be his job. If you, if so, uh, uh, like this is this a whole, gentleman. Kill McCud. This is all restorative justice where like if somebody stabs me and I go, oh, it's okay because, you know, it's, a, it was, it's an accident. It's like, that shouldn't be the rules. You, if you get stabbed, you get stabbed. If you get cheated, you get cheated. No. I What's don't the point that. of having a central organisation? I think if the player has a material impact on the play as in he touches the ball or he prevents the ball crossing the line, then, then you have... So Marcus Rashford had not interfering with play. <laughs> No, 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 that's different. No, it's that's not different. different. It's exactly the same. He's clearly infer- interfering with play. If, so if, there's, if, if I'm taking a 40, right, a 40 metre free, yeah. that I want to, to score a goal from, and there's an extra body between me and the ball, he's having a material impact. Because all of a sudden, I have an extra man on the line, and I have somebody, I have two men marking the tall guy on the edge of the small parallelogram. Mm-hmm. So of course it has a material impact. Straight away it has a material impact. The existence of space is a real thing on a football field. <laughs> if I, why was Jason Sherlock out running, running routes mm. as a water carrier when uh, the opposition were taking kickouts for the dubs all those years? Because it, it, it closes down space. And when the dubs did it, we were like, oh, that's genius, isn't it? But actually, it's not. It was illegal and they've changed the rules as a result of it. It's illegal to have 16 men on the field of play. QED, game over. Yeah. They should, they should forfeit the game. Mannion was there within earshot of the 45 kicker. And I was thinking, right, he's under the Hogan stand. He could be saying anything to him. I don't know, I don't know if he said anything to him. But you know, if it, this is the way Gillick Games operates. Do you honestly think that it, it, it's fine, it's no big deal? I don't think it's a big, not a big deal. But I don't think that the punishment would be a replay. Fits the crime, if you know what I mean. I think... Um, but how, I think there's, there's, what if they'd lost the game? Like, we don't, we don't know. It's a, it's a complete... The, the game is not the, it's not the same game anymore. You're literally cheating as a as a team if you have a a sixteenth man or a seventeenth man. Mm, no, I, I don't. No, I I don't think that a replay should come of that. I think the the, the Irish Times sets it out quite well this morning. I think it's Sean Moore and has well, a piece in the Irish Times where there's three. Di- I think there's three different uh, potential punishments where yeah. you could be fined or there could be a suspension Why are there for so someone many? involved. Yeah. But um, I don't think I don't think and and by I don't think uh, Glenn would look for a replay. Oh, they should be, disqual- they should should be disqualified be- outright. They should just hand the trophy to Glenn. It shouldn't be Glenn's call. <laughs> just that's, give him the trophy. That's madness. It's like it, it shouldn't be Glenn's call. It's it's the central organisation say this like is a, an egregious breach of our rules where it's a fifteen aside game and you are playing with seventeen men slash sixteen men for a key a key second. It doesn't matter how long it is. Like we know <clears throat> we we know. We know how flaky Kilmacud are. We've seen it. We saw it in the semi-final when that game almost went to extra time and they had to catch the ball under, the, under their own post with the last kick of the game, right? Against a far, far inferior side to this Glen side who are charging in the last few minutes. The ghosts of the last year are there and they have an extra man stopping the ball. How does that not have a material impact in the game? If, if what Kilmacud did happen to Monaghan, I'd be standing outside the CCCC offices with a uh, down with this sort of thing banner. That's what I'd be doing. I'd be disgusted if it was my club or my county. Uh, I'll be honest with you. And I, I only feel so angry about it because Maliki Rook was on the wrong side of this. <laughs> in this innocent, innocent bystander. Yeah, in they'd be disappointed. Thing. They could have won that Completely. game. Completely. They should have yeah. won the game. Yeah. May, maybe should have won the game. Chemical were brilliant as well. They, were, they had times on top when they just didn't make the most of it. We asked in the final chances. third, Glenn, sometimes. But, but I, I like, honestly legitimately feel like this is something that they need to get sorted properly. And there, there, there can't be no repercussion for having like too many players in the field because it's you know uh, oh we can't count sorry well uh, that's not credible like and the players decided that they weren't going to come off well then that's deliberate and once it's deliberate there needs to be a repercussion for it, it yeah like if it was accidental I'm okay, okay fair enough accidentally but accidentally you've gained an advantage whether it's perceived or not like if it was a, if it was an 8 point game or a 10 point game and this happened you'd be like okay no material impact yeah exactly if, if, if the fact that it was 145 there was a kick of the ball in it. You know, if there was four points in it at that stage, I don't think any of us would really feel too... But if, you, if you're eight or ten points up and you have an extra player on the field, you're still breaking the rules. Yeah, I, 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 you're saying because it had no material impact on the game, you can see a situation where they're giving a slap on the rift but, and it's not a... But in this instance, I don't think that's credible. And I, I do think that, like, if you're 
like we we've seen players will do absolutely anything to win in All Ireland. Mm. We've seen like throwing GPSs. We've seen shaking of goalposts. Like we, players will do absolutely anything. What's going to stop the manager sending on two extra players? Like what's going to stop that? Yeah. I'm <laughs> oh, they got away with it in All Ireland final. So That's we'll get away with it in the semi final. And maybe there'll be a replay. There probably won't be a replay, lads. We'll 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 find something in the rule book. I, honestly, I'm. I, you're more steeped in the GA than either of us. I don't think. I'm not I sure think about still that. Still playing. So, and you you think that Kilmacud should be allowed to continue to keep that on the basis of it didn't? Uh, that's interesting. It's mm. definitely a viewpoint that like not many people are. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. But the thing, I think you make a fair point that there has to be consistency. Like this rule has been under scrutiny before. I think. Yeah. And if memory serves. I think it's been mentioned in certain places. Oh, five, when, the club game of Meath. Well, even more recently, um, when Robbie Henley had that free kick for Mayo against oh, yeah. Dublin, and remember it was retaken? Yeah. Was that because there was a player coming off the field or there might have been an extra player on the field? There was some speculation after that as to why that So if they'd retaken taken. it yesterday and said, look, uh, you had too many players, that would, they would have been away, that would have been okay. And I think everybody would have been happy uh, with that. Acceptable, yeah. That play is Take a dead play. Yeah. Put the players off, retake the 45. That would yeah, that would have completely got rid of it. Yeah, but like, is the is the sideline official not aware of this? Like, if Malachi Rourke has his hands up in the air and Ryan Porter and his, presumably the entire Glen backroom team were aware of it, were aware of of an extra player or the subs being made and players not coming off, then surely the sideline official was was aware of it. What's your instinct about what'll happen? I don't think there'll be a replay. I don't think I don't think uh, I don't think much will happen of it at all, to be honest. Um, and that's I think. That's okay. That's because Glenn won't won't push it, and and it's been left to Glenn to do something about it. It's not that's that's the problem I think here. It's not up to the GEA or the CCCC. It seems to be a Glenn issue. They have to go forward and say we want something done here, which is ridiculous. It shouldn't be up to the club. It shouldn't. It should not be up to the wronged party in these instances to seek fairness. No, the organisation should be like, we're going to be fair to everybody who takes part in it because that's what we believe in. Anyway, sorry, what else is going on? Well, there's uh, tennis uh, this morning. Andre Rublev threw to the quarterfinals of the men's singles at the Australian Open. He came through a really cracking match against Hagerun this morning in five sets. Novak Djokovic in the early stages of his match against Alex de Menor in the last 16. In the women's draw, fourth seed Caroline Garcia of France is out after losing in straight sets to Magdalenette of Poland. The Irish cricketers in action in their one-day series. Uh, third match against Zimbabwe this morning. That game is currently on hold due to rain. Zimbabwe won the toss and elected to bat first their 55 for the loss of one wicket after 13 overs. Good night for Leona Maguire on the LPGA Tour in the Tournament of Champions. Six under par, her final total in Florida, and she finished in a tie for ninth. Canada's Brooke Henderson was the winner there on 16 under par. And another good night for Mark Allen, despite a nervous finish before landing the World Grand Prix title last night. He beat Judd Trump by 10 frames to nine. Uh, what, what are the chances of Park Harrington playing in the Ryder Cup? Uh, Corey Carrington was just fantastic yesterday. It was actually a great morning of golf. Um, God, I don't. I. I mean, you wouldn't put it past him. You wouldn't put it past him uh, because he looked razor sharp and uh, he had a brilliant round over the weekend where he had six birdies in a row, I think, on the back nine. Mm. And he actually went on a. He was close to a similar run yesterday. Um, I think he has it in the back of his head. I. I definitely do. Now he, he might have to modify a schedule to do that in terms of playing more events on the on the DP World Tour or maybe on the PGA Tour that, that will qualify. But I mean, if you're Luke Donald and uh, I suppose you're you could say Europe are kind of in transition where they have John Ram and Rory McIlroy as experienced players, but they're still quite young. Yeah, hundred percent. If you wanted some extra experience in the team room and Harrington is is playing well, form and experience exactly. He's got both. Uh, boxes to you know, because he's worked really hard, I think, on, on speed and distance and stuff like that. And he's, he's obviously right up there with the other players on tour that are 20 years younger than him. And he's, so only, he's only 51. Daniel Craig is 54. I think that's the benchmark <laughs> we go off now, isn't it? That, how, how old are you compared to Daniel Craig? He's three years younger than, Dan, than 007. He probably has the same physique as well. 100%. We should get them the tops off, lads. Let's see. <laughs> what I was going to say, we should get them on. Yeah. yeah, and Harrington made an interesting point. I was reading some quotes from him. I'm not sure was it recently or not, but he made the point that, that golfers tend to have a week or two where they will have a chance later on in their career. So if you think of Greg Norman, Harrington went up against him in 08 at Tom Perkdale. Watson. Tom Watson the year after in 09. 
So might Harrington have a chance in I some mean, of the majors not. this Let's year? talk ourselves into it. Yeah. Andrew Ferguson's the new <laughs> Harry Kane and uh, we're going to have a major victory from Park Harrington this year. Wouldn't that be a story? I think the fact that Harrington's been winning like every week he plays in the seniors tour, like it's clearly having a knock-on impact on his... You know, it's got the competitive juices back on again. Hundred mm. percent. He's just a he's a fascinating character when he talks in his interviews, and he's mentioned that that playing on the Champions Tour, he says, you know, he's pretty much in contention every other week, and just being in the mix so often just sharpens your game. And uh, there was certainly evidence of that this week. So let's hope he can keep it going. But uh, disappointing day, by the way, for Shane Larry, mm. um, didn't happen at all, unfortunately. Uh, particularly on the back nine and uh, Seamus Power had a reasonable finish so not a bad week but it's um, a couple of decent events coming up now as well so McElroy's back in action this week too Evan Ferguson was three when Harrington won that Open in 07 <laughs> I mean that'll put things into context so he was born in 04 and that was 07 so there you go scary alright good stuff Carl thanks Cheers very much for that thank you. it's uh, 8.50 this morning OTBAM brought to you live each morning by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day a couple of comments coming through here uh, going into Rugby World Cup 2023 in France this year are we going to have to worry that French TV won't show replays of dangerous tackles against their own national side bit of a joke points out Tim Colhan. yeah you'd think that the host broadcasters will have some like non-local staff involved in those decisions mm. Yeah, I mean, you'd think, wouldn't you? Le cheat. Then again, like, uh, you know. How did, they, how did they win the whole thing in the first place? Yeah. So that hasn't, there's been no controversy at all whatsoever about France and the hosting of the World Cup. No. It's all been seamless. Mm -hmm. did, we, did we dodge a bullet in not getting this World Cup? I think so. Is that like something that's, um, you know. <laughs> Everything happens for a reason, Jer. There you go. This is one of them. Uh, Maurice O'Leary on Twitter says, spot on, the Croaks win should be null and void with the GA having the cojones to call a replay. If this is left to stand, it opens the floodgates for any club or county to break the rules. Mm. Like, it's your biggest game. It's the biggest game that's going to happen this side of the start of, like, the proper... Some of the Ulster football games. Yeah. Even then, none of them are going to get knocked out of the Sam Maguire, really. No. You so, imagine. like, this is the biggest game for months and months and months and months. And it's like, ah, you can have 17 on. What's the big deal? Yeah. Well, Mon Monaghan are playing Armagh this Saturday night. I'm going along to Castle Blaney and uh, If Monaghan are a point or two down in, in they got time, a couple of extra lads. Throw, throw them on. Because yeah. there's, there's no repercussions. There will be no precedent for anything to, to be fixed about it. It happened, in, as we said, the Meath Club game in 05. But this is a bigger standard. This is the All-Ireland Club final in Croke Park with a lot of eyeballs watching on TV and in person. So the pressure and the onus is on the GEA to do something quick. Uh, Cormac Byrne, have to agree, the foundation of fairness in the game is it's 15 versus 15. Andrew Donoghue says, can't disagree, has to be replayed minimum, can't be having this, sets a dangerous precedent if it's just a fine. And Paul Buckley on Twitter says, if Croaks have any decency in sportsmanship, they will, should be offering a replay. I think if Croaks are offering a replay, it's because they feel like there's a chance that they might get kicked out. And that's generally what happens. Um, and Sean Bourne's piece is pointed out there uh, by Carl. Uh, in the past, these offences caused a great deal of controversy. The penalty was an unyielding automatic forfeiture. Mm. Uh, that was generally mitigated into an aggrieved, the aggrieved team offering a rematch. So, so Glenn are offering the rematch. It's yeah. in their power, as opposed to it well, being in Croke's power. Okay, well then, Glenn should do something about it. Some of the comments, and I've just looked up to confirm, and I'd forgotten about this, Armagh Leash in a qualifier a few years ago replayed, as Leash used too many subs by accident. That's 2016. That game was replayed. I mean, there's precedent for a game to happen again. Yeah. So just yeah. do it. Yeah, and there's plenty of time for us. Off you go, lads. And um, yeah, no harm. Anyway, 8.52 this morning. Time for us to turn our attention back to the big story of the weekend in terms of football. And uh, that is the fact that Arsenal are the real deal. Um, they established that over the course of the first half of the season with 50 points, just the fourth team in Premier League history to manage that. I'm delighted to welcome Simon Collings from the Evening Standard to the show. Simon, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Um, what, is the, what are the, the press conferences like? What are the players like in the aftermath uh, over the last, I don't know, six, eight weeks. What, what's the actual sense that you're getting when you're, when you're talking to these players and you're seeing them interact with each other? Because um, one of the things that keeps coming across is the sense of unity that they have, and you can't fake that. No, you really can't. And I think those scenes that we saw at full-time yesterday at the Emirates, I can't remember seeing anything like that since it was open in 2006. And, and the way it was celebrated by players like Zinchenko, Gabriel Jesus, you know, these are guys, between those two players, they've won eight Premier League titles. And the way they were celebrating that, you can see what it means to them. And, and if you speak to people at the club, this change in mentality that has happened over this season has been key with those two guys coming in and not accepting that Arsenal won't compete for the title. And, and Zinchenko was one of those players who spoke after the game yesterday and he said, 
when he came in, he, he told the squad, look, we, we can go for the title here. And a few of them laughed, but I think now they're starting to believe that something special can happen. And, and it's everywhere you look at the club, the fans, Arteta himself, there is this sense of unity that for years hasn't been at Arsenal. And finally, it's clicking in what could be a, a really special season. In a weird way, the fact that the, the two lads who came from Man City haven't played every minute of every game and been the outstanding, the only two players who are carrying the team, it's even more powerful that they're saying that because you're seeing everybody else step up and take leadership roles. And it's that sprinkling of young players in the spine of the team who are winning games and deciding games with, them, with obviously the, 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 the support in various stages of um, you know, Jesus before the injury and Zinchenko since he's come back. Uh, but it is amazing that like uh, the, the psychological impact that they've had has been backed up by the players who were already there. Yeah, and, and I think it probably helps that they've come into a young dressing room who are happy to be moulded and sort of follow their lead. And and Jesus in particular, I think people at the club, Arteta knew his personality, but I don't think other people at the club realised what sort of person he was. And he's been out obviously for these past sort of six weeks with a knee injury. But he's basically been at London Colney the whole time. You know, he's stayed around the group. He's actively helped Nketiah to be ready to step up. You know, talk about young players in the spine of the team. And Nketiah's had to come in and lead the line in a title-chasing team, and he's done exactly that. But he's had Jesus been there and support him. And I can't remember seeing many teams with substitutes bench who celebrate like Arsenal do. You know, these are players who aren't getting on the pitch and they're still celebrating as if they were there, the ones scoring the goal. So it's absolutely huge. And... To have this spirit, I think, is really the key to Arsenal's success right now, and it's boring out on the pitch. I think you described Eddie Nketiah, uh, Simon, as as an unlikely hero in the, in the post match mm. or your your match report. He's been brilliant. He's just stepped up massively since Gabriel Jesus was injured, which I think has taken a lot of football fans and Arsenal fans, uh, to be fair, by surprise. Yeah, I think Arsenal fans have, have struggled to be convinced by Nketiah. It, it thought at the end of last season, you know, when he. He came into the team and had a good run when they came so close to getting top four that, that he might have won them over. But still then, I think fans were very much, the jury was out. But if you speak to most Arsenal supporters now, I think they'll accept that they they appreciate what Nketiah is. And he's he's more than just a backup striker. I think he's really stated his claim to be someone who should be getting plenty of minutes. And the one good thing for Arsenal, I think, when Jesus got injured is that as bad as it was, it happened before they went to Dubai for that sort of mid-season break. So they knew as soon as they landed in Dubai, right, we've got three weeks. We've got to get Nketi ready because he's starting on Boxing Day at West Ham. You know, if this had happened around sort of New Year's Eve when the games are coming thick and fast, I would have been intrigued to see the impact. But the fact that Arsenal had that bit of luck you need in, in big seasons to be able to get ready and say, look, Nketi, you're the man for, you know, two months or so. Get ready to step up and, and full credit to him because he's taken the opportunity which if you ever speak to him, that he said that's all he ever wanted. He never he never demanded to be, you know, taken as the number nine, but he said, give me a chance, let me show you what I can do, and then judge me. There's even the fact that they just haven't been behind in games for too long, like this this entire season. And and when Rashford opens the scoring for United, you're thinking, okay, United could push on here, even though Arsenal were on top. But Arsenal's response, like it has been all season, was was quick and effective. Yeah, and, and the, the thing last season was Arsenal's failure to come come from behind. I think that that Wolves game um, sort of around February last year was one of the few times where they were trailing and came back. But this time, every home game where they've gone behind, they've gone on and won it. And the players, when you speak to them, a big thing they say is the new atmosphere at the stadium. And, and you would have noticed it when Rashford scored that goal yesterday, which is the sort of goal that would, would suck the life out of most stadiums. Fans were just standing up cheering the team on. Odegaard in the middle of the pitch is waving his arms. Arteta on the sidelines, cajoling everyone. There's, It's a sort of mentality that, that, that champions have that they will win eventually. We will get the goal. And I think that, that was seen by the fact that, you know, they were just behind for seven minutes and then they're level. So that is a big change for Arsenal and that's what big teams do. You know, they don't trail for long. They, they find a way back. Can we talk a little bit about Arteta our, our and um, the, the team building over the last number of years as well? Because... Um, at various stages, uh, the the form didn't quite match what he thought they the team were capable of, and uh, it wasn't nailed on that he was always going to be supported the way he was in the off season last year. What was it about him that allowed him to kind of come through the difficult periods in the past? I mean, the the, the big thing for him is that he always had complete backing from the club. You know, there was 
externally, I think he was under big pressure, particularly in that sort of COVID years. But the Cronkies were absolutely convinced that Arteta was was the right man to lead them. And, you know, they went down this path of fully backing the manager to the extent where the squad has been overhauled to, to fit him. And the cultural reset he's done has been massive. You know, if you look at the team yesterday, they're basically all his players or their academy graduates. He has got everyone on board that he wants on board. And I think... For someone like him, who we, we saw glimpses of it in the Amazon documentary, um, who is a very hands-on coach, quite sort of out-of-the-box thinking, again, likes team bonding and stuff like that. I think he did struggle in, the, in that COVID era, and it's perhaps understandable that he did because he couldn't really operate the way he was. And given the problems Arsenal already had in the, in the dressing room at not being united, I think that really exacerbated the issues he had. But the support he had from the club, I think, was vital because... For me, if he was in the situation at different different top clubs, I couldn't see him surviving it. Any uh, negatives to take from from yesterday, Simon? I mean, I guess after United equalised for the second time with the Martinez header, there were a few mistakes. Tommy Yasu wasn't brilliant when he came on for Ben White, and Ben White was taken off for a reason. He wasn't great himself. Um, any concerns or worries as you head into the tail end of the season? Or the second half yeah. of the season, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it feels strange. It doesn't feel like the halfway. It feels like we're further down the line than that. But mm. um, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't think Arsenal were great in that first half. I felt like they were a bit sloppy. You know, the Rashford goal is brilliant, but Partey's is pretty loose with his pass and then gets gets skinned by him. Um, ben White, who has been very good in, in fairness, you know, picks up a yellow card and, and plays like a player who's who's worried about being sent off. So, uh, still for me, when I look at Arsenal and the concern I have is is the strength and depth. I know they brought in, in Trossard, they're bringing in Kiwawa, the Polish centre-back, but I do wonder if if you, you know, you lose, they've obviously lost Jesus, but if you lost the Thomas Party, if you lost a Gabriela Saliba, a Ramsdale, how would that squad cope when the spine is really damaged? You know, City, we've seen going to Chelsea and bringing off Grealish and Mares off the bench. Arsenal can't quite do that. And when the fixtures do get really congested in the April-May time, that for me is when we're going to see if the squad depth is an issue because so far Arsenal have sort of breezed through every test. But I think when we get to that business end of the season, they're going to need to see the full strength of the squad. And that would be my concern. But right now, they've got to be favourites for the title. We saw some nice flashes from, from Leandro Trossard when he came off the bench as well. Simon looked lively. Um, and I know the disappointment of missing out on Mikhailo Mudrik was, was there for a lot of Arsenal fans, but he's not a bad replacement. And then Jakub Kivior, the TV cameras, uh, pulling up, panning up to him at one point as well, the Polish defender. I mean, a couple of smart acquisitions, and they haven't exactly had to break the bank either. No, and, and I think they've pivoted well from, from Mudrik. Uh, uh, Arsenal you know, fans and the club themselves disappointed that that didn't happen. I think even more so when anyone watched that game at Anfield and saw his, his cameo, how bright he was. But... You know, look at someone like Trossard. I think you saw exactly there the benefit of signing someone who is completely ready to go because Mudrik hasn't played since November, obviously. You know, Premier League proven. You know what you're going to get. Throw him straight into a game of that magnitude and he fits it. He gets the pace. There's no no settling in time. And I think back to that Newcastle game where Arsenal struggled nil-nil. If they'd had a player like Trossard coming off the bench, things could have been a bit different, I think. And then Kiwara is, yeah, someone who more sort of fits the mould of what Arsenal want to do in terms of their transfer business. I think Trossard is outside of that, given his age. But Arsenal wanted a left-sided centre-back who could compete with Gabriel, someone who's tall, someone who's strong, someone who's good on the ball. He ticks all of those boxes. And at the price they're paying, which is about sort of £21 million, there's hope that, you know, you've got some sort of good value and resell in there as well. So... Good business, I think, from Arsenal. And also, they acted fast because a week ago, certainly on social media, Arsenal fans were sort of pulling their hair out thinking, you know, the window's dead, we've missed our top target. And the club, give them credit, have, have reacted quickly to that. It's funny how football comes in waves. Like, you look at the Arsenal United, as we were saying earlier, Gary Neville described it as retro. There was a retro feel to it yesterday. And mm -hmm. with Liverpool and Chelsea struggling at the moment, of course, City are still there and thereabouts. Um, but... Arsenal and United back where they want to be challenging. Now, United won't exactly challenge for the title, you'd imagine, on, on the basis of yesterday's, yesterday's result. But there was a bit of a nostalgic feel to the whole thing. Oh, massively. And the style of the game, I think, fitted it. You know, it was like a basketball game, that it was so sort of end-to-end. -end and and those were the great games of, you know, the early noughties between Arsenal and, and Man United. And I do think un, under Ten Hag, United are going places. They Even from the start of the season, you can see the, the massive steps they've taken. And it was interesting, you know, when we started our chat, and we were talking about mentality and the changes. 
And Ten Hag in his press conference made that point saying that if, if United want to take that next step, if they want to win trophies, if they want to win titles, they need to change their mentality. And I think they've started on that journey. But you can see Arsenal are just a project which is just a few years ahead of them. Mm. And that's why I think you know the title this season might be a bit far for United. But for years to come, I think they will be a team that should be challenging at the top because like Arteta, they've got a coach who is ready to come in there and rip things up and get them done the way he wants them to be done. Yeah, and he's a he's a hard ass uh, in the same way that Arteta is, and you can mm. see that he the discipline is something that the players are responding to. I, I do want to just ask you about that mentality, right? It's an interesting talking point ahead of the Manchester City games that are, are coming up, because in the long run, if they were to draw the league game and get hammered in the cup game, mm. it doesn't matter. But I don't know, what like footballers and the psychology of a team and a squad... Does he pick his full team for the cup game and try and beat Manchester City and say, look, now we can do this? And Or does he need to? Is, it, is there like just a little bit of uh, cutting his cloth over the next couple of weeks that he needs to be careful about? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. I, I think the schedule will will help Arteta because of the fact that obviously they go on the Friday night to, to the Etihad and then they've got a full, well, they'll have over a week until the Everton game and then they'll have another full week till the Brentford game. So it's not actually too congested in terms of, you know, if players would be fit enough to play. And I would be inclined if I was him to go with a fairly strong team because, you know, you are right in the sense that in terms of the league table, there's no there's no points on offer. But the, the psychological impact, I think, of going to City and getting turned over, particularly when, you know, you're playing them in two weeks, I think could be quite detrimental to a squad that, you know, are really going on the right way forward. And it reminds me, I think it was... Might be 2007, 2008 when Arsenal were pushing for the title and they sort of wrote off the FA Cup and Man United took them to the sword. And the impact that did have on their league campaign was seen then. And I think for Arteta, he certainly won't, you know, throw in a load of kids, which he never does in, in FA Cup or Europa League. But he will bring in some players. But it wouldn't surprise me if you saw someone like a, a Gabriel, an Odegaard, maybe a Saka, just some sprinkling of first team players because I think you've got to keep the momentum going right now. I don't think you can afford to say, let's get rolled over by City, we can focus on the league because right now there's something building and, and everything that can help to that is is massive. The fixture list is pretty sweet after that for like most of March into early April. Uh, you mentioned the Everton game. It's Everton, Brentford, and then obviously the massive game against Manchester City. But after that, it's Villa, Leicester, Bournemouth, Fulham, Palace, Leeds and then Liverpool at the start of April. Now we can count chickens because uh, we don't have to play these games. The the Arsenal fans, I presume, are desperately trying not to count their chickens. But that's about as good a run of fixtures as you could hope for at this stage of the season. Yeah, massively. It does make me think, <laughs> what's April May going to look like the back end of the business season? But yeah, I, in those run of games are where Arsenal are going to want to take advantage. And they're in that. We can see the advantage they're building already because if they win their game in hand, whenever that's rescheduled, which is, is Everton at home. You know, there'll be eight points clear of City and to have the luxury of playing Man City twice and knowing in theory you can lose both games and you will still be ahead of them in the league table mm -hmm. is huge. And they should be looking at this run of games as well, thinking, look, we need to get as many points on the board here. So when we do get to those huge crunch games at the end of the season, they've got that buffer to play with, which is what they didn't have in that top four race when obviously Tottenham pit them last season. So it's huge for them. And, um, you know, the the interesting thing you say about not trying to count chickens, I was on the tube coming home from the game and there are a few Arsenal fans in there saying, look, well, at least we've definitely got top four now. We've got top four. Um, so they're still trying to not get carried away, even after a game like that. I think um, they're just trying to keep their feet on the ground, but it's proven pretty difficult. We're going through something similar as, as Irish football fans with Evan Ferguson and uh, all the different types of goals that he's scoring at the moment. But I can only imagine what it's like to be an Arsenal fan watching Bakaya Saka become an absolute global superstar at the moment. Yeah, he's he's become... I mean, if you think back to that sort of Euros final and the way he's elevated his game since then, the mentality of him is is, is ridiculous. He's just relentless. And coming up against Luke Shaw yesterday, who for me has been probably, if not the best football fullback, one of the best fullbacks since, since the World Cup came, finished the Premier League returned. Saka was absolutely on him all game, taking him on, beating him. And for someone so young to be driving that team forward in a title race, 
is incredibly impressive. And it's why Arsenal you know, are so desperate to tie him down to, to a new contract. You know, all this talk about Mudrick and new wingers. I think Arsenal fans would just be happy if, if Martinelli and Saka signed new deals. Just a quick word, Simon, on, on Granit Xhaka. You wrote a piece in, in advance of the game talking about how vocal he is recently and how much of a leader he's become. Hard to believe. You think back to him being stripped of the captaincy at Arsenal in 2019. He's the, the vice-captain now. But I mean, there was even the video on, on Twitter I saw of him in the in the you know warm up ahead of the the North London derby, and he's properly vocal, as you say, and really encouraging his teammates. He's come a long way, Granit Xhaka. Hugely, and I mean his his story is probably you know sums up Arsenal's redemption as as a, as a club and so you know as a whole because he was a sort of a lightning rod for criticism and and the issues that they had at that club, and the way he's come back has has been incredible, and I think he has actually. He's benefited from not being the captain. I think he was someone who doesn't really need the armband to lead. He is just naturally a leader. Um, but there was, I think, people wondering how would he cope being the sort of vice to someone like Martin Odegaard, who is quite a quiet person, quite calm. But actually, they play off each other really well. And for Xhaka to be in this position now, where he's sort of leading Arsenal as one of the key players towards possibly a Premier League title is yeah it's pretty unbelievable given the situation he was a few years ago and it sums up the Arsenal story which I don't think many people can really believe at the moment yeah and I know they're they're pinching themselves and the 50 points is remarkable but at the same time kind of almost unnoticed another hat-trick for Haaland and whatever little blip he was in for a week and a half however long it was is over (laughs) and so there is a strong possibility that um you know Manchester City do go on one of those runs where um, they've got some dirty petrol out. He, they've been roundly accused of lacking effort by their manager, and the fans, the, the fans have been at the end of it, tongue lashing as well. So, like, it looks like we're going to have a proper title race. I think so. Yeah, whether Arsenal go on and win it, you know, I think you, I think you can, you justifiably debate it. But they look like a team that will last a distance in terms of staying power, and I think that is the thing you always look at with City is they are a team, which we've seen historically they've done in seasons gone by, that can go and stick 10 wins on the spin together in the last you know, 10 games of the season. They can do that. And yeah, the narrative around Erling Haaland, I think, lasted for about a week that City might be better without him. I think that's been <laughs> quite quickly put to bed. Um, I think if you've got someone who scored four Premier League hat-tricks in his first six months, he's probably going to be a pretty good player for you. Yeah, City could easily do 50 points or more in the uh, second half of the season as well. Mm. So uh, it's game on. Good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning, Simon. Cheers. Thank you, guys. It's, uh, Simon Collins giving us his thoughts there on the Arsenal situation. Um, in fairness, we should give him, because he's not here, some credit. Nathan, after uh, Man United beat them the first time, I was like, oh, this is a stereotypical, flaky Arsenal. Arsenal going to Arsenal. And he was like, no, 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 this is, this is the real deal. They've been doing this now for a few weeks. They look really good. So I was like, no. Come back to me when they've put it. And then they put it, they put it together. They had, I hate to admit this. We had our crystal ball recorded around Christmas, before Christmas. And... Uh, in terms of Premier League winners, the only man who said Arsenal was Adrian Barry. All oh, right. Me, you, and Nathan went for Man City. No, we're not dead yet. We're not dead yet. But I mean, Adrian he was saying the other day he ha- off air has his uh, has the clip ready to go of him predicting Arsenal to win the league before Christmas. So he'll be unbearable and unthinkable if Arsenal do go on and win it. But I mean, fair play. I didn't expect. I think everyone expected a blip from Arsenal. Now we realise there is no blip coming. You well, can that, that fixture list. If the blip comes in the middle of that fixture list, then something is, uh, is yeah. seriously wrong. Uh, all right, 12 minutes past nine this morning. Here's what's on OTB Sports Radio for you uh, across the day today. OTB Gold is our interview with the former Donegal footballer Luke Keeney, who had his hip resurfaced. Splunk is uh, at three. Uh, a classic games club is Kerry versus Tyrone. I'm not sure which game this is from four o'clock, but um, it's in celebration of uh, Miko and his... Um, uh, Married to a Toronto woman. Uh, Michael Owen, Life After Football, is 6 o'clock. And the show is live tonight from 7. You can follow off the ball across all our social channels and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network for all the best in the latest sports content. After the break, we're going to hear from the Munster coach, Neve Briggs, after her side retained their Interpro title over the weekend. First, here's a devastated Emmett Bradley after Glenn's defeat yesterday and some GMAT goodness to cheer him up. The minute it's raw at the minute. Um, we can hear the disappointment in your voice, but... If you look at the journey, you know, with the club, with, with Maliki O'Rourke, two championships in the last few years, an Ulster title, you overcame Schlock Neil, Kilku, you're here in your first All-Ireland final appearance. There's so many positives with this group. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's such a tight group. I'm, I'm really proud of every man on there. I'm proud of every, you know, everyone in our club. They've, 
everybody's rode them behind us, and you know, as I say, we've given them some good days, but look, <laughs> aye, that's that's devastating. Um, I don't know what else to, to say about it. Um, yeah. And the partnership with you and Connor Glass, that's been the talk of the, the club championship, I think, of just how epic you have been. It's been brilliant to be able to watch it. Yeah, to get an opportunity, to, I suppose, to play with a player like Connor is special. He's uh, he's his ultimate teammate, and anybody who plays with him would say that. And hopefully there's plenty more days like that. Yeah. Got on, so... Go and go get your dinner. Yeah, Thanks so much. Thank you. Testing one two one two. Gmac one two. Gmac's morning motivational moment, or something along those lines. There's so many to choose from. Very good morning, uh, Graham McDowell here at uh, Gmac, as you guys like to call me. Some uh, some Monday motivation for you now. Turn off your mind, relax, and float downstream. I don't like swimming myself. Uh, not a big fan of snakes, alligators, spiders. Yikes. That's your Monday motivation. See you tomorrow. GMAX morning motivational moment. Or something along those lines. There's so many to choose from. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio. Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Off the ball. And he also said to ask him about the Hummer golf buggy I saw him driving in Portugal. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the Hummer golf buggy, it wasn't mine, it was a friend of mine's. And uh, I uh, I rented his place and um, he had, that was his buggy to get about. So, yeah, it was interesting. I was trying to keep my head down at times. But the flash. It should be. It was a little bit, yeah. Not sure what Ricky would have made of it. <laughs> Off the ball. Weeknights from seven and weekends from one. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. OTB AM. With Gillette, get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. Right, I'm delighted to say Neve Briggs is with us, uh, fresh from celebrating Munster's interprovincial success. Neve, how are you? How are you getting on? Hi guys, how are you doing? Congratulations. Thanks, William. Thanks very much. I'm a little bit hoarse from shouting during the match. Or singing afterwards, and, hopefully. And the celebrations. Yeah. Uh, and the celebrations after. So, uh, yeah, look, it's a great weekend. Uh, delighted. I'm delighted for this group. They've been uh, exceptional over the last few weeks. Um, when you're a, a team who is already successful, there's obviously demands and expectations. So what are you looking at as a coach when the whole competition starts, apart from obviously thinking, geez, we better win this? Because, uh, you know, if you start thinking too much about the victories, then you kind of forget what you need to do week in, week out. So when you were sitting down at the start, what were you looking for? Yeah, a big thing for me was to, in terms of in, just inject something new into the group. Because we had coached together last year, Matt was the head coach, and then we flip roles this year, and and we had a huge amount of young girls. I think that was really important. I think bringing them along, we had you know we had to pick our squad, but then we had five or six girls that we we identified as they were all in around the eighteen year old mark, and um, we had them train with us for everything, so that knowing that the next time that there's an interpro, I imagine that those five or six girls will be playing senior rugby for Munster, so. Stuff like that was really important. We spoke a lot about our identity and our culture and um, and what it means to play for Munster, I suppose. And I thought the rugby would take care of itself. It was such a quick turnaround from the AIL to the Interpros that we 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 worked very hard on us as a group, as opposed to the rugby. Um, and, I, and I'm really glad it worked. It's funny you talk about the the uh, culture and identity. Uh, like obviously, there has been interprovincial rugby for. Uh, a long period of time, but it feels like there's been a reset since the uh, latest changes in in uh, women's rugby in Ireland. So there's a big opportunity for you guys to set down markers for future generations and a bit of a responsibility to not just build on what was there before, but to be better than what has what has come before. So how do you even begin to tap into that and have those conversations with a, a new group and a diverse group? Yeah, look, we spoke a lot about um, the, the the feeling or I suppose it was more to do with what for each individual what I meant for them to play for Munster like and I sent out a survey and stuff came back and when when the answers were coming back from the girls I was I was I kind of it was only then that I realized how big a deal this is for players because when you're playing when I was playing it was 
you know, you loved it and it was great, but I never really thought about the external stuff. And I was getting stuff back, like life goals made, dreams come true. And I was like, like if somebody's bought into something so much and that much, then we can then go and do something really special. And for them to be able to do that and then have the courage and the ability to be able to play the brand of rugby that we wanted to play it was brilliant. And and they were getting a huge amount of enjoyment out of it. We as a coaching group were getting a huge amount of enjoyment out of it. So then you found that you were rocking up to training or to meetings or whatever it was, just buzzing to get going. And I think um and I kind of that was kind of the general kind of feeling from the squad at the end of at the end of Saturday. You used an important word there, Neve, the brand of rugby. And that that's something that has been you've you've been so exciting to watch. Fifty points on the board. There's pace, there's intensity. I mean, it, it, it's it's a style of rugby that's going to encourage people, A, to want to play for, for your team, but also B, for people to want to watch. Yeah, look, I hope, I really hope. I think I think the game is evolving really, really quickly in Ireland. And um, to be fair to um, the, the lad side, so Ian Costello, um, Mike Prendergast, Graham Roundtree, they, they've been really, really good for, to me since I, since I got this job in the summer. And... And you're going in and you're watching your training and you're starting to think, okay, look, we clearly can't get through all the work that they're getting through. We're not professional. We're only going to be together for a few weeks. So do we go down the road of trying to be very prescriptive or do we go down the road of playing, you know, putting players into positions where they have to make decisions um, at pace, under pressure? So we went with a lot of kind of game-based scenario stuff and it was brilliant. The first couple of weeks, not so much. I started to doubt myself a lot because... Um, there was lots of mistakes but we stuck with it and they stuck with it that was the most important thing the players they literally believed in everything that we were trying to do and and it's great because when you sit back and you get to see a try like the Rachel Allen one at the weekend where they went from literally 95 metres you, you know that they believe in what they're trying to do and they're trying to push boundaries all the time um, that's what I thought I thought it was brilliant we had uh, we had Tim Stillman, who's an Arsenal reporter, on the on the show recently, and he was talking about the new stadium wrap and marketing. You know, there's a serious amount of parity between the men's and women's team in Arsenal at the moment, and you even had forty five thousand at an Arsenal uh, Chelsea game in the women's Super League recently. Feels like something special is happening along similar lines at Monster Neve, if I'm right in saying. I know there's, as you said, a gap between professionalism and amateur, but there seems to be a lot of effort and marketing being put into the women's team. Yeah, look, and I think to be fair, it's across all the provinces. I think when the games are, you know, on television, when the sponsor like Vodafone comes in, it's huge. It's huge for the girls, it's huge for the, you know, for the women's game. It's it's very important stuff down to, you know, anything we looked for off the pitch was taken care of. Um, and I think that makes a huge difference to the players. Um, this year, like, they were all given training kit and it may seem so, some, something so simple, but they rocked up all in the same shorts, jerseys and socks for training. And they're all looking around and they're able to buy into something then in terms of what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to make this a high performance team. We're trying to make them better rugby players. We're trying to bring the next group along. And I think I think the way the game is going in Ireland, it's 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 evolving so quickly and and it's not perfect, but it's it's on the road to being so much better. And I think that if that's the case then you know, we're just going to be in a much better place. And I just think it's a really exciting time to be involved in women's rugby in Ireland. It's also credible for any of those kids who are coming through, you're talking about 17, 18, to think and dream that they could actually be professional rugby players who stay at home and play for Munster and Ireland and have a, a career in the game, which, you know, 10, 15 years ago, unfortunately, for whatever reason, was incredible as a dream. Yeah, hugely. Look, we've couple of 18-year-olds on our squad that played uh, over over the three games. We've got a couple within the club that play for other provinces and and completely and utterly they can absolutely be playing professional rugby this time next year and to be able to go and do that is incredible. It's incredible for them but it's incredible for the game and we, we have three of the girls in the squad so obviously May Vogue, uh, O'Leary, Dorothy Wall and, and Enya Breen and um, the shape they came in was incredible. The pace that they were able to go at pushed training to a, a new level for us. But their skills were so much better than even what they were when they were in Japan over the summer. So imagine that like that small amount of work, you know, in five, six weeks since they went professional in the first week of November. I'd love to think about where we can be this time 12 months. So 
Um, yeah, look, and it was it's incredible. And we we had like loads of young kids. That's a big thing I noticed over over the three games, whether we were in Cork or in Galway. The amount of young girls at the games were huge, and lots of them there with no affiliation to any player, but just there because they play rugby now in their clubs, and and also they love it. Um, so yeah, look, it, it was it's it's been brilliant, but there's still a bit of way to go. But I, I just feel like it's it's just a very exciting time to kind of be in and around the mix right now. And how how about your own uh, coaching skill set? How do you manage to? benchmark how you're getting on and, and improving and, and constantly learning as well because you, you're talking about being in, in high performance you obviously are a leader in that and you have to set the tone for that and um, you know that's a, a journey that every coach has to be on Yeah hugely look I very much I look for affirmation a lot of people I think um, with the lads that I'm coaching with um, with the, the leadership group but also with players or, or coaches externally you know if I'm not working um uh, as a garden in Limerick, I'm, I'm down at Munster training, whether it's their NTS sessions or academy sessions or whatever, just observing coaches so I can get as much as I can. I think um, I did a Canterbury Crusaders coaching academy course over um, in like October, I think, for six weeks. And I learned so much about that. It was nothing to do with rugby, it was to do with everything off the pitch. And um, you're just kind of looking to kind of build and grow all the time. And when I'm with the club, I think you're dealing with players who have never played rugby before and play rugby for Ireland in that kind of group. And so you've got to have different expectations and, uh, you know, you have to be very understanding of where they are as a group. Whereas I felt when we went to Munster, it was just another step up from that because everybody has aspirations to go and play rugby for Ireland. And when you're at that kind of a level, you know, you can push them a little bit more in terms of their understanding, their detail. You can push them in relation to the pace and the intensity that they go at things. And, and that's a great learning for me. So, yeah, look, it's it's great. It's been a really good two years learning loads and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. On that off-pitch stuff and the psychology, Neve. I mean, for any team who or sports person, for that matter, who's being remarkably successful and has a great period, motivation can be an issue. You know, you've back-to-back wins now for the first time since 2015. Clean sweep of bonus point wins as well in the Interpros. But I guess the motivation for you guys next year is the target in the backs. Everyone wants a bit of monster now because you're so successful. Yeah, look, maybe I, I'm not really sure. It, the, the women's game is a bit odd because it's in terms of of how it's blocked. So we don't really get together again um, unless something is going to change in terms of the season structure until next season. Mm. So a lot of players will either not play next year or new players will come in and push for competition. So it's not really the motivation in relation to wanting to go and win again. You've got to go and fight for a place in the squad. You've got to be able to, you know, we've got to see an involvement in relation to the player depth and strength and uh, um, and development of those players. So, um, yeah, I it's it's just it's it's an odd thing because it's not like like you'd love it. I would absolutely love it. If it was more than the five or six weeks that we had together. I I think that there's definitely benefits to it. But they go back to clubs now, or they go to Celtic Cup and and Six Nations. It is really only next season again that you get to have something like this. I think that's why they buy in so much because it's so special in terms of it's just so unique. It's only for a few weeks. Um, but look, that's a, 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 another, another long time away in terms of, of where we are next season. So we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. All right. You, you had a pretty, I just wanted to ask you before, you could only have a pretty surprising and special moment after the game against Leinster last weekend. Was it Claude O'Halloran? Got down in one knee and, and Chloe Pierce said yes. Nice to have a little engagement to keep the heads up. Yeah, look, it was brilliant. Uh, Claude rang me on the Monday to ask him if he was it okay. Um, I was shocked and then I had to mind the ring for the week. So <laughs> um, it was burning a hole in my pocket. No pressure. <laughs> uh, no, um, but look, I was delighted. I was delighted for them. Um, we speak a lot about Munster being a family. They felt they wanted to do it in front of their family. Um, and Munster were a part of that. So uh, no, it's brilliant. Uh, it's really good. They were buzzing after it, to be fair, and all the players were as well. And uh, luckily enough, you managed to win the tournament as well. So it's an all-round <laughs> celebration. Win-win. Yeah, hugely. Listen, Neve, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thanks a million. That's uh, Neve Briggs there. Uh, coach of Munster, who've just uh, racked up a uh, second successive Interpro series. It's 28 minutes past nine. Some breaking news this morning. It's not really breaking. We knew this was going to happen. Frank Lampard is gone. Uh, according to Sky Sports, they're reporting from outside Everton's training ground that Lampard is gone. Official announcement still to uh, come from that, but... I don't think anybody is surprised.
No. Well, Frank Lampard says he, he doesn't fear the sack after the weekend, but uh, I, I think he, the writing was on the wall for him, wasn't it? With Mashiri being there and the, the kind of awkwardness of the, the post-match, um, I guess, Mashiri interview with Sky, if you call it an interview, and Ken Wright as well. I, it's just a matter of who comes in now. I, I can't see Duncan Ferguson being an answer. Wayne Rooney, we were saying, saying recently, I don't know if he's the answer either. Well, if, I, if I'm Wayne Rooney, if you're advising him, you're like, take that job in the summer at some point and maybe take that job when they're in the championship, if that's what's uh, what's in Everton's future. So you can bring them up and be the Messiah and you have mm. like a, a winning culture established. What if he keeps them up? What if he takes it now and keeps Mike them Lampard up? Mike Lampard did that. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Do you know? Uh, um, yeah, and you don't have the off season to do it, and also, I don't know. It's it's one of those years where no one, no one team has sunk like a stone just yet. Mm. So it's not like you're fighting for two relegation spots. There's a good chance you're going, you're you're going to go right to the very end of the season. And um, I like you know, Sean Dyche is a grown up. Come in, have a two million, three million bonus to keep them up. Yeah, and then he can leave in the summer if he wants, or he can stick around. Mm. I think Sean Dyche was obviously pigeonholed at Burnley because. Burnley had no money to spend. Yeah, at Everton they have managed to absolutely waste every single penny they've spent, but they've spent a fortune, mm. and they will generate loads of loads of money in the future. So, I think Sean Dyche could be not a bad manager of a team like Everton in the Premier League. Yeah, perfect with, fit with investments. Ah, uh, per Frank, what what happens to Frank next? Where does he go? Well, he he needs to back to the Championship. Uh, I think he needs to do some coaching courses and to like spend some time working in backroom teams and. Like learning that side of the game. Can the ego take that? Being a Premier League manager going to a backroom? Well, because otherwise he's going to become Steve Bruce in the last decade of his career where he manages teams who aren't very good and the fans don't really want him around because he's failed. Mm. You know, he's, he's now got successive failures on his um, on his CV and oh. there aren't a whole heap of jobs out there for managers with successive failures, you know? Lampard and Gerrard are, are similar. I think there is a pattern there of top players jumping and diving maybe a bit quickly into managerial roles yeah I think you can do your backroom stuff for years and years and years and there's a number of examples of people doing that right at the moment Stephen Reid is doing it uh, Andy Reid is in it Nottingham Forest Robbie Keane is kind of behind the scenes none of them are jumping into management roles and there's a reason for that they probably look at the likes of Lampard and Gerrard and think nah not for me just yet I mean history is littered with them of course but like his his brand and his brand value is really high it's just that the, the teams haven't played really well organised football you couldn't point and say that's a team who knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing that's a, a, a manager who's got a clear vision of what he's trying to achieve mm. and he's going against the grain in this way or he's following these trends and he understands them and he's clearly communicating those to his players and his players are going out really well organised and well structured like recently did a really good performance beat somebody well and then the next week he went from three at the back to two at the back and you're like what was the point of that and inconsistencies yeah or like what is the philosophy behind what you're trying to achieve now look maybe you play horses for courses and that's fine but you need to come out and explain well, we did that because of this and we felt like this was going to give us the best opportunity to victory it just it, I don't know I like I actually don't dislike Lampard. I no, think. no, I think he's a likable guy. Yeah, and I think there's, there's loads of ways where he could use his experience of many different managerial styles and loads of success and loads of disappointment, particularly international level, mm. into something. Uh, maybe maybe like an, an England underage. Yeah. Like a career there. Get involved a couple in the of FA. years to like go and sit and listen and have conversations. I'm just looking at the, the so next ever manager, some of the odds. So in 50 of Nuno Espirito Santo. At nine to one, Rooney at seven to one, David Moyes, <laughs> he'd have to lose the job at West Ham first, and uh, behind Sean Dyche, who is the favourite at six to four, is Marcelo Bielsa, which is interesting. Wow, I mean Bielsa in the summer, mm. I'd be very excited about what would happen at Everton if they did that. But <laughs> Bielsa right now, like, yeah, would that work? I don't know. He still lives in the he still lives in the, around Leeds. Yeah, I think he? he does. I think Everton fans would be quite pleased to, to have Bielsa. Yeah, board, sure. I mean that would be that would be very exciting. You take him. Can he do it in the middle of the season? Ah, Maybe he can. I don't know. Let him at it. He 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 took over in the middle of the season yeah, at, at Leeds. He did. Didn't yeah, he? I think so. Right. Uh, so that's the uh, news this morning. Uh, we did ask a question about should the All Ireland Football Final be replayed? This is uh, Glenn and Kilmacud because Croke said sixteen slash seventeen men on the field. You know. Uh, and the response is two thirds in favour of a replay one third saying nah move on mm. so we'll see Ronan Kenny on YouTube saying I think a real issue in the Crokes v Glen issue is Shane's utter infatuation with Malachi O'Rourke this is Shane's only motivation in this debate incorrect incorrect I love Malachi O'Rourke 
but fair is fair. Replay the game. I don't think I don't think it matters who the Glen management is. I do love him. Let's be honest, he's a fantastic coach, but uh, irrelevant in this debate. Just replay the game. Right, we're back tomorrow morning. Uh, we're live every morning in association with Gillette Labs for an effortless finish today. On tomorrow, we'll have Michael Darren McCauley and Eamon McGee to talk about toxic masculinity in sport and plenty more besides. Up next, you're going to hear Robbie Henshaw chatting to Cameron Hill in partnership with Aya. Uh, they're the leading Irish vitamin and supplement brand for all the family. Delighted to announce a brand partnership with Robbie Henshaw. Uh, Aya is committed to delivering only the highest quality food supplements and vitamins to support health and well-being for all the family. A range of 36 products catering for adults, children and babies exclusive to Irish pharmacies. Aya is widely available across the country including All Care Pharmacy, Life Pharmacy, Hickey's Pharmacy, Macaulay Pharmacy and other leading groups and independent pharmacies. Uh, enjoy this. We'll see you tomorrow. All right, Aya is the leading vitamin and supplement brand for all the family and is delighted to announce a brand partnership with Irish Rugby International player Robbie Henshaw for 2023. AIA is committed to delivering only the highest quality food supplements and vitamins and to support health and well-being for all the family. Exclusive to Irish pharmacies, AIA is widely available across the country and I'm delighted to be joined by Robbie Henshaw today. Robbie, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Not at all. You're coming back from uh, injury at the moment. Uh, when can we see you back on the pitch or expect to? Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, things are going well. Um, I'm potentially back uh, back to full contact in the next couple of weeks um, so yeah uh, things are on track uh, aiming to be you know fit um, fit in about two two three weeks time so uh, yeah so we're hi- yeah, hitting the right markers at the moment um, and things are progressing I read that you were um, watching the last dance last year when you were feeling ill ahead of the game to Toulouse are you watching anything right now that's going to get you back in the swing of things um, I haven't really gone gone back to the sports talk. Although um, I, I saw Netflix recently re- um, released a, a tennis kind of a documentary on called Breakpoint. So I've started watching that, and it's pretty pretty good to see kind of how how the individual sports people in tennis uh, operate. So it's it's fascinating. You talked about last season and how you struggled with injuries at the start, and then you aim to bounce back and really finish strong you've had a few issues this year are you planning on the same kind of trajectory um for 2023 yeah i think so uh last year was definitely stop starty in, in terms of of injuries for me but uh yeah gonna look to last year and um see how i how i went that way and in, in terms of you know coming back and making sure i finish off the season strong so um yeah a bit of a blip this this season in the middle had a good actually had a good strong start to the season um playing a good few games with leinster at the start of the season then no November kind of um, I got stopped in, in my tracks a bit with the hamstring but you know um, it's good starting the new year on a positive note hopefully in the next few weeks and and build build towards the end of the season Yeah uh, obviously yesterday well we're recording this on Friday but uh, mm. the Ireland squad recently announced you're not in it yet but maybe more of that and on um, <laughs> but in the squad is Jamie Osborne mm. uh, obviously a Leinster teammate of yeah. yours and uh, first call up you've played alongside him were you surprised that he got his call up this young no absolutely not um, I think we've seen um, the talent he he is um, we we recognise him Leinster brought him in training when he was you know just out of school as a, as a 19 year old um, he's massive talent um, so we've seen him uh, on the training paddock the last few years what he's able to do and um, it, he's shown in his performance last week against Gloucester it really showed he's, he's capable of stepping up to the next level so he's no, he's brilliant I'm delighted for him Yeah because a lot of people have made much of the fact that he's 21 years old he's only had 28 appearances for Leinster people think maybe it's just a little bit too soon but I mean you got your debut mm. when you were 20 years old if I'm right in thinking yep. and it, it took t- like a duck to water so yeah. Is it really like is a youth a big factor? Or is it when you're ready, you're ready? Not necessarily. I think it's. I think when you're you've been in the environment which Jamie has been in and out training with Ireland, and he's played on the kind of emerging Ireland uh, team as well. So he's he's he has experience uh, in and around camp, um, and I don't think youth is is a factor. I think it shows. Um, if uh, I remember someone who said to me, if you're if you're good enough, you're old enough. So um, I think he's shown that. Um, how do you cope with that step up from international level because it is a huge step up um, and we've seen players who've just come in had a few games with their province and gone all the way to the top mm. so how do you get that confidence and make sure you hit the ground running 
Yeah, it's about probably staying calm when you get get your foot in the door. Um, you know, things are definitely heightened in terms of pressure, uh, your time on the ball, um, physicality, everything detailed. You know, things are definitely heightened and go to another level. So probably being calm and being able to, you know, take what comes in your stride. Um, yeah, so that that'll be my my way of looking at it. Um, not getting too um, obsessed with it either. You know, being able to, you know. Um, have fun along the way as well I think is important well, fun along the way is a good uh, good point because mm. sometimes I'd say you have your half a mind of I need to impress and do something that's going to wow everybody mm. um, and another part is I don't want to say like I just need to get through this but you want to make sure you get through without making any mm. mistakes so is that a balance that's always in the back of your mind or do you really do you just play as part of the team um, I think off the pitch, there's always um, there are always great crack in the changing room, uh, in the coffee room, you know, around the around the dining table. So, I think when you're the, the the old saying, when you're on, you're on. So when you're on the pitch, you're on. When you're in the gym, you're on. Um, but you know, when you're off the pitch, that's when you can have a laugh, um, have the crack with the lads. But you know, in in a good way, that you're still getting work done around your analysis, around your getting with your other teammates and um, making sure you're you're on top of your work and looking back at training and things like that. Uh, last season felt like a bit of a season of nearlies for both Leinster and Ireland. I mean, you lost the URC semi final to the Bulls, came up just short against La Rochelle, and you know, but for the kick of a ball against France, we might have won the Six Nations. So. <laughs> What does that do for 2022-23? Is that in the back of your mind that we nearly got there this year and there's a little bit more to do? Or how does that affect you? Yeah, I think, you know, last year was obviously... There's fine margins, is what I call it, in terms of some of those... Um, top level games like you like you alluded to the La Rochelle game just find f- just little moments in the game that you know bounce of a ball we could have won that game you know literally um, so I think yeah it just goes to show when you get to the top level um, there's no real second chances you, you you don't have the the time in the game you don't have you don't have the the chances if you're given chances and you don't take them it'll come back to bite you so I think that's probably a learning from probably all the last season the the games we've played is is probably not just that little bit of being clinical um missing that little bit and and then not having the time to make up for it let's go back because as I said it's nearly 10 years since you made your Ireland debut it's 11 mm. years since uh, I saw you first in a mm. school scups uh, final against my beloved Sligo Grammar you won that day and uh, sorry about that <laughs> thank you. I was waiting for the apology thank you very much but um, do you have fond memories of playing those schools cup games because I mean they are a different kind of pressure, aren't they? Absolutely. I was just yeah, I did a recent interview for for um, a school's uh, cup spread because I know the school the cups is starting soon, mm-hmm. uh, and I just said one yeah, it was one of the one of my favourite um, periods of playing rugby was. With, firstly, as you're with your mates in school. Uh, secondly, just so young, and um, you know, uh, for what we did in terms of winning the cup, it was it hadn't been done in 35 years. So that period of going through the year and, and playing well in, in the games, um, we had good challenges. We played away in Gloucester in a in a schools kind of competition. We came up to Black Rock and played played the seconds team up here, which a young Gary Ringrose was playing 15 at the time. Um, so there was oh, there was great great memories along along the way and definitely one of my favourite periods of um, of my career but, or just leading into my professional career was that last year in school playing with with my mates. Mm, yeah, um, how does the pressure of playing in Eden Park or Twickenham compare with going up to Sligo to face the Grammar or going down to Ballinasloe to face Garbley? <laughs> um, the pressure not so much. I think the pressure of playing on a uh, a, w- a waterlogged pitch or playing o- <laughs> playing up to up muck up to your um, up to your ankles. I think that's probably that brings on a different sort of pressure and a different game. So they're they're the memories that you know I I want to forget is playing those kind of even the Mars like the 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 pitch you know was hit and miss a lot of the times. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> boggy enough stuff, but no great crack. Brilliant. Um, when you got into the Connacht side, I heard recently that. Um, when you were just breaking in at like nineteen twenty, Dan Parks was a really big help and an yeah. assistant to you. What kind of stuff did he um, infuse you with in terms of confidence and helping you find your feet there? 
I think yeah Dan was brilliant firstly he was such for such uh, a big name to be signed in Connacht you know he was he was the big name who the first big name who, who they'd signed um, and you could see the minute he walked into the club um, you know he led from the front uh, his his energy in and around training off the pitch was, was second to none like he's always in a good mood real positive um, and for me he just kind of helped um, grow me in, uh, like lead me into professional game he, he helped my growth as a player um, and yeah I always um yeah, I'll, I'll always remember that, you know, and I'm grateful for, for what he did for me in terms of that. And do you feel you've an onus now to kind of mentor the younger players? I mean, you're a mm. two-time Lion now at this stage. You've done pretty much everything there is to do in rugby. Or do you think, that I have no truck with that. I focus on my own game. You know, you just have to be a little bit selfish. Or how do you go about that? Um, I don't know. I definitely, definitely think there's there's an onus on on the senior players to to help the next generation, to help the the younger guys coming through. Um, but again, it's hard to step aside your own game and leave your own game and go to, to help someone else in terms of you have a lot to think about as well. But um, I think it has to be from both sides. Um, the younger guys need to be able to come and, uh, and ask you things I think that's that's key um, and to come out of their shell that's that's a big thing um, but yeah for me I definitely it's a thing that I'll, I'll look to do um, in the next few years is, is to sit down with, with the younger guys coming through uh, Jack Hardy was in that senior cup team as well wasn't he or was he uh, Jack was the year before year before yeah, right yeah. so you would have played together obviously mm-hmm. up and through senior cup and Connex as well you faced each other yeah. as well a few times and um, playing for Colin mm. Leicester respectively how do you are you trying to you know one up each other or how does that <laughs> dynamic work yeah it's um, for all, I've played on the same team for Jack for, for most of my life um, yeah, no, he's he's a great mate, and um, he's been brilliant for Connacht. Um, he's he's closing in on Eric Elwood's um, all-time record. He's he's not far off, which is which is great to see. Um, yeah, it's it's funny enough. The first time we played each other was only I think two two years ago. I think um, you know, just the way the games fell, I never never got to play against him. But um, yeah, we had some some funny. Uh, Interactions within the game had a, had a laugh and, and a slag, um, but yeah, it was definitely weird because I, as I said, I usually used to play on the same team as them, and coming out lining up against them was was different. Is that um? Do you know some of his ticks? Does he know things that he's going to target in your game? Does he? How do you how do you balance that while still kind of keeping that friendship? Um, well, I wouldn't say we know each, each other's game unbelievably well, but. <laughs> Um, just more the interaction. I think um, you know when he first, when I first ran into him, when he tackled me or when I tackled him, you know it was just funny. I um, had a laugh on the ground getting up after and, and um, kind of something stuff like that. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So the squad, the Six Nation squad, is convening mm. now. I think they're going to Portugal for some warm yeah. weather training. Yeah. What's that like being on the outside looking in when you're still kind of in recovery mode? Are you? Mm envious what's going through your mind um yeah listen it's 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 for me it's still a little bit too soon to to be there so i think yeah obviously you want i want to be in my head i want to be fit i want to be available and, and go and, and be in, uh, be included in the squad but um yeah i'll be i'll keep the head down now and and make sure i, I get myself right um just i know what's what's around the corner and um it's it's a big year so i think I have a chance to just make sure everything's perfect uh, prior to coming back um, and then hopefully um, we'll see what happens come um, the, in the next few weeks. And when you're down and when your confidence is a little bit lower, um, I know there's a huge emphasis now on mental health and player mm. welfare and being in that right mm. mindset. How do you kind of balance that? I know you've got plenty of I wouldn't say distractions, but diversions through music and yeah. all other sorts. Are they good aids for you in terms of getting over the disappointment of not being out there? Definitely, yeah. I think um, not staying inside, getting out for a walk with the dog is, is another um, meditation for me. Uh, sorry, meditation as well is brilliant. Mm. Uh, just just um, you know, finding the quiet space, putting the phone down. Yeah, um, yeah that's brilliant. Um, yeah, it is, and and I think as you as you said, I think mental health in 
within the the world today is is a big talk uh, big topic. Um, we're lucky enough that we have a good good core group of su- uh, support within the RFU and within Leinster. Um, Tackle your feelings has been launched. It's um, a service that's available to all players, a counselling service. So there's people there to talk to if if you are down or in need of of, of someone to ch- talk to. So you know it, we're making great great. Um, strides forward in, in that sense mm. but um, yeah I think you just have to take every day as it comes try and stay positive and, and realise I think a big thing is realising that it's not going to be every day isn't going to be a good day right. uh, and being able to accept that and then make sure you try and come back in and, 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 fl- and, and try and flick it yeah because uh, like the frustration I know you've had your issues with injuries and mm. lots has been made of the fact that you'd come back and you'd still be the same player you were but yeah stringing a strong string of games together was something difficult does that kind of frustrate you sometimes or do you is it just part and parcel of Um, being a rugby player no I think it's part and parcel of being a rugby player Um, you just need to be able to to deal with it accept that it's it's the nature of the game Um, but yeah it's uh, always a player I pre- played it previously uh, said to me when he both of us were rehabbing together he said um, always look at it as, as a window of opportunity to develop yourself develop your your body physically and to come back stronger and, and, and you know rip back into it so I think when you are out for a prolonged period it, it gives you more of a hunger to get back and, and to enjoy it more so Right okay mm. uh, you're into your seventh season at Leinster now at this stage mm. are you a proper Dublin boy now or <laughs> have you still maintained your connection to the West or, or the yeah, Midlands really? um, Yeah I've, no I definitely still still maintain my connection um, I don't get home as much um, my parents definitely remind me of that <laughs> uh, but yeah no I still always um, always have time for 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 everyone back home and, and always um, grateful for, for the support that you know the town of Athlone has given me and will continue to give me um, you know there's some great people there that have supported me from, from when I was a kid so um, you know, I'm truly grateful yeah because like you're someone who clearly loves your community in Athlone mm. that love is very much reciprocated how does it factor into your performances and your overall goals yeah I think um, when you see what it means to to people around you, um, I'm not even saying from where I'm from, but the whole country, even across the globe, um, a key um, example of that was when we went to New Zealand and just talking to people after uh, after that third test and seeing what it meant to people at home, and you're seeing videos of people, you know, watch up early watching it. Um, it almost injected, you know. A massive lift and of energy and, and joy to the to the country, and we only we only kind of seen it uh, when we got back in Irish soil, like and then over Christmas, kind of seeing snippets of the. I haven't watched the full documentary, but seeing bits of the documentary and um, you know people talking to me after saying that it was you know unbelievable, um, just what we did, and uh, I think that that kind of that spurs you on as a player to try and you know um to re- make make those memories more more often or to for people to have that more often you know that kind of experience and that that feeling yeah last one from me Robbie then yeah. um we have a big 2023 mm. coming up to six nations champions cup it's a small matter of the world cup later on in the year mm. what are your personal goals for 2023 yeah, so firstly get back on the pitch, um, and then um, I suppose hopefully play in it, play play a part in the Six Nations, um, and then hopefully you know target the kind of finals rugby, uh, knockout rugby stages with Leinster. Um, you know we every every club's ambition that's in both competitions is to win it. So yeah, personally is is to be involved and, and have have um, you know have an impact um, positively in the group. Uh, for the remainder of the year and hopefully finish with, with silver. OTB AM with Gillette. Get into your flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with a